welcome to a new episode of the Game Former Show. I'm your host, Ben Hansen, joined by Jeff Marchiafava. Hey! Daniel Tech. Hey, I'm here again. Are you happy to be here? Uh, I gotta tell you, we have a real big show today, and I'm really excited about that. I'm excited to have Matt Miller on this podcast, too. Big show. Big show! Big, big show. Hell of a show, that's, that's everybody. Right here. Here's why it is a big show. Uh, we're talking about Into the Breach, a mm. new tactics game that Miller's red hot on. Should mm. be fun. Then we're uh, mopping up feces on aisle six. Uh, we're talking about Kingdom oh, Come Deliverance wow. and Metal Gear Survive. <laughs> that, Look, you're not going to save it until yeah. we get there? Wow. Look, we promised that we would get the final verdict on both of these games. Jeffum and Serial have poured a lot of time into each. Jeffum maybe more than any human being has ever played any game. He's been playing Kingdom Come Deliverance, so we're going to weigh in on exactly what that game has to offer people. Um, then after that, we're getting Kyle in talking about some mobile games, maybe, and he's also been playing Moss on PlayStation VR. Mm, there's definitely that subset of mouse. people. Yeah, a little cute mouse. Little but mouse. there's people that write in and say, like, hey, you guys should talk about more VR games. Yeah. Where's the VR love? Here's a, here's a little game starring a mouse. A little love right there. Let's talk about it. Um, some other things along the way. Then we have some great community emails. Some really good ones, Dan. I hope so. Some really good ones. Big show. Big show. Because <laughs> real big show. the back half of the show, we have a special guest Skyping in, Jordan Thomas from the Question Studio. Uh, Jordan Thomas, maybe not a household name, but after this interview, whew, households are going to be buzzing, Jeff. Um, because, JT. that's right, uh, they're working on a new game called The Blackout Club, which the easy pitch is Left 4 Dead meets Stranger Things. Okay. So it's a co-op, neighborhood-based, bizarre uh, some would say Lovecraftian Dan Tech experience. There's a lot of those these days. But there's a lot of development talent on that team, including Jordan Thomas, who's leading the project. He worked on all three Bioshocks. He was the director of Bioshock 2. Uh, so we talk about the crazy amount of love that that game still gets. Like someone just heard into the podcast not that long ago saying like, why don't you give more credit to Bioshock 2? Uh, he also was a consultant on both the South Park RPGs, so worked a lot with Matt and Trey. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he also goes back to like working on Thief 3. He... Worked on the Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone game. He's been all over the place. Can we just skip right to that interview? It sounds so good. You know so what? Good. Let's That's go ahead and play right now. No, but okay. stay tuned for that. It's a good time. Um, that sounds like the kind of person you'd want on a really big show. That's right, Miller. And that's why we See, I think Miller gets the, the big show thing. I'm, Hell I'm yeah, he this. gets it. You know, big show, uh, big time, big fun time. Uh, this Saturday, by the way, at Fulton Brewery in downtown Minneapolis. Jeff, there what's go. going on there? Uh, we're having a huge party for 300 issues. <laughs> We're going to allow only 300 people in the door. That's not true. But for Game Informer's 300th issue, we're going to be at Fulton Brewery, downtown Minneapolis. That's March 3rd. So if you're listening to this in time, we encourage you to come on down. It's free. We have no idea what the crowd's going to be like. It could be overflowing. It could just be Andy McNamara and I. I have no idea. So please come down. Say hi. Uh, come Keep talk to ben us. and Andy company. <laughs> please do. It'll <laughs> be a good time. We're going to be revealing uh, the next wave of covers for our 300th issue, Dan Tech. Yeah, we are going to We be worked really hard on this, this issue of the magazine. I think it's going to be pretty cool. Absolutely. You know what else is cool? Hmm. Into the Breach. Oh, man. That's a great game. <laughs> Miller, it's very exciting. Like, you know, you never know. I think you were playing this game at home, and then you came into the office buzzing. Yeah. It's so fun to see a person reviewing a game come into the office like, oh, we got a live one here. Yeah. Like, you were so excited. You gave this game, what, 925? I did. It's, uh, it's the follow-up from Subset Games. Uh, their previous game is FTL. A lot of people played FTL, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, that's kind of a... Everybody knows that game, I right? So. You either played it or you've seen it, right? The, the ship... With the little aliens running around. Yeah. You die a lot. You start over. That's the deal. It's popular all over the world. It is. So this is the next game from that small independent studio. And uh, they maintain the structure of multiple playthroughs. That kind of what we call rogue light experience of, of going through, seeing how far you can get, maybe finishing a playthrough, unlocking some stuff, and then kind of going through again and again and again. Now, to have that work, the actual gameplay of any given playthrough has to be a lot of fun. And it is in this case, although it is very different from FTL in that gameplay. So the structure, the broad structure, the sort of top level structure is what you like about FTL. But the gameplay, instead of it being uh, the, the fighting the alien ships and boarding the ships and all that kind of stuff, it's a, instead a grid-based tactics game. Um, that has a lot in common, weirdly, with uh, chess. Uh, really? Yeah. Uh, some people would say... It, I mean, like, you guys have played it, right? Like, it has it mm -hmm. has some of that. I, I don't think I'd say, like, chess exactly. Really? I, you know, definitely, like, you know, 
very tactical and stuff, but not. I, I don't I don't draw the same conclusion. I guess. Would you go with an Advanced Wars reference before a chess reference, Dantec? No, it's certainly way different than Advanced Wars too. I mean, on the surface, like on the previews and stuff, it's like, oh, this is going to be like Advanced Wars. But after playing, a, you know, a significant amount of it, not not so much as chess. I've tried to like break it down to see like what it is underneath all the the graphics and systems, and it's just like, Ones and what zeros. is this? It feels more like like a Tetris to me almost. I know it mm. sounds absurd, what? but like. <laughs> Just it's arranging chess and Tetris. It's, it is again, I will. I will say this in defense of of trying to um, mark these these strange comparisons is that it it is not exactly what it appears to be. Really. Right? Um, the to explain my my ch chess analogy, it's that in any given turn of uh, into the breach, you've got like an eight by eight grid. You've got three mechs that you're running around with. You're trying to. You're taking them back in time. You're trying to save the world from these kaiju monsters that are going to kill everybody. Okay. And those mechs are on the board in particular spaces, and the monsters are on the board in particular spaces. And in any given turn, it feels to me like you're trying to prevent checkmate. Because that's that's the idea. And right? checkmate means damaging the buildings and the yeah, surroundings I mean, and stuff. If in in just one or two turns, I think it's fair to say, if you just didn't do anything, it's game over, right? Like the monsters will show up. They'll blow up the buildings, humanity's destroyed, and that's kind of it. Yeah. And then it's time to start a new playthrough. And so on any given turn, you're looking at the board like a puzzle, right? Which I don't know if uh, I, I'll be interested to hear your, uh, your comparison to Tetris, but that's how I see it is that on that turn, it's this puzzle to solve. How do I make sure that I take as little damage to my units as possible? I make sure the buildings, the grid doesn't take damage because that's what's going to kind of carry over from one battle to the next. And I'm pushing and pulling and um, and damaging enemies. I'm moving them into environmental effects on the board. All to try... Your, your goal isn't really to defeat the monsters. It's to hold off the monsters. By and, killing them. And we should... Not necessarily. Okay. Because at the end, there's a countdown. like Or throughout the, the game, there's a countdown going of usually five turns... And when those turns are over, you're just, uh, it's just done. The monsters disappear and you win. And we should note that the enemy turns or what they're going to do on their next turn is always laid out. So you know exactly what they're attacking and how they're attacking it. Like in a Final Fantasy X style way where it says on the bottom it's, of the screen? Or? It's much more specific and, and um, central to the gameplay than that. Like at the beginning of the turn the monsters or the end of the previous turn depending on how you think about it the monsters move they get in place and you see on the grid okay this monster is going to hit these spaces for this amount of for damage. this amount of damage oh wow okay. and inflict this environmental effect here right everything is is meticulously expressed so that you can you know cover your mouse around the board look at all the different units and really understand exactly what is going to happen. It's really it's a it's a lesson in clarity and design. Just it, overall stripping everything down, just communicate effectively to the player. It is, and when you start, I, I, I argue in my review of the game that the other thing that it does really well is that immediately you understand it. You you're not good at it immediately, but you get what's going on right away. You you can play this game for literally like in the first battle, the first two minutes. You can kind of understand the fundamentals. There's not None of the numbers are big. You know, nobody has like, this guy has 7,300 hit points and this guy has 14,000. It's not like that. It, this guy has three hit points. Love it. Uh, this other guy has two. Um, your attack will do two damage. And, and so you, you can understand what's happening right away. So it all begins to come back to the singular turn in front of you and the tactical decisions you're going to make to solve that puzzle of not having things fall apart. So, Jeff, can you help me understand what's transcendent about this game? <laughs> like, it seems like it's a it's a well-designed little tactics game. I feel like there have been a lot of those games released. What do you think is special about this one, Jeff? Um, that moment-to-moment -moment gameplay that Miller was just talking about, where every turn it is this puzzle of, okay, how am I going to stop them from completely wrecking me? 
and you have three characters with three abilities. Each one can only move a certain amount. And every time you're puzzling out, okay, if I move this guy here, I can nudge him, and then his attack is going to hit that enemy, and then I'll move this guy, and there's an environmental attack that's happening here, and you kind of end up feeling like a genius every turn when you actually <laughs> puzzle it all out, and it's like, okay, I survived for a turn. And then more enemies spawn up, and everybody <laughs> moves around, problem. and, you know, they... they cast a web on one character and then he's stuck and so you have to figure out how you're going to free him next time and it's that constant you know moving it forward one step and trying to survive just one more turn this sounds hard well that's the other thing that i think that the game does particularly well is cater itself to almost any player I would be happy to put this game in front of somebody who has never played a video game and expect that they would be able to grasp it and find success with it. Just an alien landing on Earth. An alien landing on Earth. I'd be like, here, why don't ki kaiju monster, why don't you try <laughs> Into the Breach so you can empathize with humanity? No, I mean, it, it's uh, the difficulty settings are really, really well balanced so that you can set it on easy. And it's not like the developer has penalized you for playing on easy. In fact, I strongly recommend people play it on easy at first. Really? Uh, most games, I think, we as a organization say, like, you know, play it on the setting that, that the developer sets as default, which is normal, right? right? Like, that's the way to really enjoy the game. Here, it, I think it's a different philosophy. The developers have set up difficulty settings that are, are saying, you know what, like, the priority here should be you having fun, right? And so, yes, there is a way to indicate your mastery in that playing on the harder difficulties, you get a higher score, and, and that's how it, it, you know you can kind of show off or whatever. But you put it on easy, and you can get, all the, you can get almost all the unlocks on easy. You can, uh, you know, each playthrough, you're, you're completing achievements, and those achievements give you points that you can buy new mech squads. The new mech squads play completely differently from the last one. So even if you do get to a point of a certain level of mastery over the play experience, all of a sudden you're back at the beginning, you have a new squad that just doesn't play like the one you just played. So there's this constant sense of novelty and discovery as you're moving through multiple playthroughs. Yeah. And so we should also note that there are four islands that you're going through. Each one has, you know, like half a dozen missions that you'll play or whatever. But after you do two, you can go to the final mission at any point so you're after so, that. So and, you're and just so it's, buying time until, like, you're feeling ready, good to go, well, point of no return. It, it's, it's more like, how far can I push it? Can I do another island? Because they get in, they'll get increasingly difficult as you go. Yeah. And so you can... So that's another way that you kind of self-adjust the difficulty of, like... Well, this mech squad is a little weird, and I'm not doing great, so I've done two islands. I can just skip ahead and finish, and finish it. And, it, and it, it's balanced to how many islands you've completed. So not only are you, you catering your own difficulty, but you're also um, adjusting your own session length, right? Like, how long do I want to play this game and have a satisfying full playthrough? Yeah. Um, I'll just do two islands and then do the last fight, and... See if I win, and that'll be great. Yeah. Um, Dan Tech, Lord of Video Games. Sure. Uh, looks down on us mortals. Uh, do you agree with this playing on easy thing? I, d I think definitely that's a... First of all, I want to say, like, I'm extremely reticent to say that I could give it to anybody who doesn't play games and have them pick up on it immediately. That's... I think I think it's a challenging game. Uh, and you, yes, I do like how you can, and you probably should, experience it on easy at first. Wow, okay. Um, it, it's... Uh, and they don't take away from that. As you said, like just like FTL, actually, one of the great ways to get the achievements and unlocks in FTL was to play on easy just to get the stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can do that here, too, which is, which is nice. But it's not, it's not easy, I don't think, necessarily. It's always a puzzling challenge along the way. It's, it, yeah, and it's, it's, the more I think about it and the more I play it, the more, again, the Tetris my, the analogy Tetris. might seem really weird. But to me, it's almost like a puzzle game. Mm -hmm. Like if they were just colored blocks on the screen and they weren't, this is a mech and this is a bug. It would be like, yes, I need to get... It's all about positioning. Like, okay. really is at the fundamental level, like, especially if you're going to challenge the harder difficulties, like, moving, figuring out how to twist your pieces, right? So that one is facing here and one of them shooting here. And it's, uh, it's very puzzle-esque, despite having that, you know, it's definitely a strategy tactical game too, but, like, it's not a game where you're like, I got to get more HPs and get this new sword and my guy gets new stuff like that. It's, it's very... 
like bolt on moves. Like this move does that, this move does this, this unit does this. And like yeah. you, your job is to figure out how to make it all happen at the end of that turn. So the discussion internally is like Leo's really into it. JV played a fair amount. He's into it. Uh, there's a certain crowd that considers this game, I think, uh, not to be hyperbolic and take your words out of context, Miller, but the second coming of Christ. Um, and then Dan Tack was like, eh, it's cool it a little bit. I everybody. thought it was good. Okay. Well, do you see any faults here? Uh, so some of the, I think, in terms of longevity, I think it might have a little less than FTL, and that depends. Um, there's ways to make it more longevity for you, like with random squads and customized squads, but like, I'm not sure if the, um, sort of less variance in the end encounter, I guess. There's only like the one, and I, I guess that's, when you got there in FTL, when you got to the end, usually you'd have a different sort of makeup to, to tackle it. Now you sort of know exactly what to expect. Um, I don't know if that, you know, it's not a, it's not a detractor. I just don't know if it's going to have the hooks for a, for a really long, a long haul. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a, it's a bite-sized strategy game, right? Like it's, you get in there, this is really cool. And you enjoy it. Uh, I just don't know if it's going to keep people playing as long as FTL did. I, right, I guess right. is what I'm saying. It's a, it's a tough bar to clear. It is a tough bar to clear. I mean, uh, FTL has also came to us from a different time in the indie game movement. Um, but I I do really feel like this is a, a better game. I think Subset wow. Games has, uh, has improved its craft and has learned some lessons from what worked and what didn't work about FTL. I'd agree with you, Dan, I th uh, that the... Um, there is the the danger of um, some of the longevity potentially being lost uh, for some players who put in you know hundreds of hours with the game. But I think that there's so many different squad combos and so many achievements to chase that for the majority of players who are probably going to be in the camp of somewhere between playing this game for ten hours to a hundred hours, that sweet spot is is totally solid, and that entire time you will find things that are cool to try, new challenges to to surmount. Um, I also think I I've always been in the camp. I know some people really love that last boss boss fight in FTL. I've always thought it's terrible. Wow. Um, I just don't like the way that it. Um, it demands very particular strategies that you spend the entire game sort of like planning towards, okay, am I going to use the transporter strategy or am I going to use, like, I, I didn't like that about the game where you would kind of get to a certain point in the game and be like, ah, it's not even worth trying to keep going because my one guy's dead. I'm just going to get to the final boss. It's going to be over. Yeah. This game does not have that quality about its its end game loop. It is a challenging and interesting fight at the end, and and you're right there. I kind of wish there was maybe a little bit more variance maybe in what that fight other, was. You know, yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's one of the early things that they attempt to patch with the game. That said, um, there is uh, the fight itself is is challenging, but without being absolutely punishing. It's very reasonable that if you're like being successful throughout your playthrough that when you can get to that final boss or final fight there's not really a boss you're gonna there's a decent chance you can win it yeah um and i i like that uh people who devote the energy and devote the time to the game are going to be able to have that complete experience consistently um let's get to the core of it here jeff um which enemy is the biggest dick in this game uh that's hard to say but there, there is one kind of, I guess they're all bugs, but one of them in particular shoots a spider web that has a spider inside of it, except <laughs> it shoots off webs in the four directions that will also lock down whatever you have there. Oh, so like traps them in the webs? Yeah, and, and for some reason, I didn't run into that guy in my first couple playthroughs, and then I bumped it down to easy and was like, okay, I'm going to do four <laughs> worlds this time. And, and I realized that my cardinal mistake that I've been making all this time is I start all my characters really close to each other and you cannot do that when that guy's out there because he'll lock down two of them and then you're just totally screwed oh god yeah I, I <laughs> but, but I also I don't want to make it sound like that is you know frustrating or game breaking it's it's another thing that you learn to work around and once I stop being an idiot and putting my characters so close together you know, I I was able to overcome that and kind of. Does it have like own. an XCOM level of just 
knowing and hating every single unit you're going up against like oh this son of a gun again <laughs> i don't i don't know if it uh, xcom was especially good at that yeah. um part of that was the visuals in xcom that you just kind of hated those guys um i i think what what this game does well especially as you because you will as you play you'll find your yourself desiring you like you're going to get to a point that you can consistently like play through easy and just wreck Right. I, I mean, that's going to happen. And then you're going to move up to normal, eventually to hard. And uh, in those higher difficulties, the sense of of looking at the board and like spending sometimes I would I, I mean, I don't know about you guys and how you play this game. But for me, I literally will like sit there and stare for like, <laughs> three minutes, mm -hmm. one turn, one bead of sweat, with just traveling one on bead of sweat traveling down and just being like, <laughs> I will not let this building fall. Like, I'm getting that secondary objective. And and so I'll, like, sit there and try to figure it out, again, because I'm kind of coming at it as, like, a puzzle. And uh, and there does come a point, especially after you've made what you didn't know was a mistake, like, a turn or two before. Like, maybe you put a guy over in a corner and you shouldn't have or or something like that. But you get to those points where it's, like, it's, it's not possible. Yeah. Like, either that building's going down... Or the train's getting blown up. And one of those two things is happening. And either way, it's gonna like there's gonna be a little like word bubble that pops up where the the the, the head of the island says, like, oh man, that building, it stood for hundreds of years. <laughs> it's just too bad. You know, like you get those you get those moments where you have to come face to face with the necessity of sacrifice. Um and and I, I don't know, I, I think that's really cool. Uh, it's exciting to to be intense to be in those moments and have to make those calls and to not know exactly how it's going to shake out and how it's going to uh, affect your subsequent playthrough. Yeah, for sure. So PC only for right now. Keyboard right and now. mouse only. Yeah. No, no gamepad support. Yep. But, I mean, you guys were even saying, like, this seems so easy to get on iOS at some point and other systems at some point. I'd be Switch surprised. is right there. I'd be surprised if we don't see it on on touch devices at some point. I think a, a console port, like a full console port, would involve a pretty aggressive redesign of controls and things like that. So yeah. I would, I, in short, I wouldn't be, you know, there's sometimes games like this that come out first on PC that you just like, ah, whatever, I'll just wait till it's on PS4. Uh, you think you're going to be waiting a while, uh, if, yeah. if at all. I, I think you should get this game now and play it play it on PC. It's not it's not going to tax your system. If you have a computer, it is probably going to play this game. <laughs> there right? we go. Uh, Into the breach, everybody. It's real good. Thanks, Miller. Uh, you want to give yourself a high five? I'll, I'll do it. Okay, great. Right, right now? Yeah, if it's you so ready? Great. Please, please. Okay. Hey, Serial Vasquez. Welcome. Hi. Man. Honor to have you. That was smooth. I'm so happy you're here. So that Jeffum can talk about Kingdom Come Deliverance. Absolutely. <laughs> Jeffum would not talk about it without me here for some reason. Jeffum, what is your hour count on Kingdom Come Deliverance? The game we talked about a couple weeks ago. It's the open world, old school-ish, medieval RPG. Uh, over 100. Over 100 wow. hours. And after all that time, you take that number and then you boil it down to one review score number. What is that score? Well, that's kind of misleading, but it's a 5.75. The review score scale. is misleading. If, oh, if you just take it by the number. This is one of those that you should read the full review for. Yes. I'm or you can just listen to this podcast and what you're that's about to right, say right now. We're going to talk about it right now. Okay. So <laughs> uh, bugs, number one? Yeah. Okay. That is that is the driving force behind that score, for sure. Because I like a lot of what the game does beyond that. Yeah. But it was so broken, and I lost so many hours of pro uh, progress to bugs and hard crashes and everything else. It's like, how do you score that? How, how do you recommend a game like that yeah. that is so profoundly broken? How did it make it through CERT, do you think? What's going on there? Isn't it a wild Is ride? that a process at this point anymore I on consoles? No, I and, don't and know. And we, sh we should note off the bat that uh, I was playing the Xbox version. Right. So other versions may be better. PC may be more functional. But based on the forum posts that I was looking through, when I was running into my own bugs, a lot of people have had problems, some even worse than me. And to be specific, were you 1X? 
Yes. Okay. And there's no sort of like early access moniker anywhere on any of these platforms. It is a fully released game, or is it in early access? I think it's just fully released. It is, it is super yeah. duper 100% released. So uh, what was the most damning bug? What was the moment where you were the closest to jumping out of Game Informer's window? Uh, well, I was at home at the time. Perfect. Uh, and I lost four hours to a bug that disabled saving of any kind. <laughs> and, and so it, it was kind of a slow train wreck of I realized, you know, after a while that the game wasn't saving during the missions that I was doing, which sometimes it's kind of stingy with its checkpoints anyway, because it has auto auto save points during missions. I thought you needed to save your schnapps. You do if you want to save it yourself manually. Okay. So if you want to manually save it, you have to drink a potion, which you can only carry three at a time, and they're very expensive, and they make you drunk when you drink them. Always fun. Or you can go to an inn and rent a room and sleep for the night. Yeah. Which is what you end up doing all the time in order to safeguard your progress as you're playing. And so you're just running from bed to bed so, and nothing was triggering? Uh, so, so at that point, I was doing a series of missions and it wasn't saving for a while. And I didn't think too much of it at that point until it, it finally dawned on me that like, hey, these objectives are ticking off and it's not giving me the saved message sign. And so then I went to my home to save and sleep and it didn't say anything there either uh and so i tried a different one you know and then started looking up you know problems and then i was like okay i'll just use my savior schnapps which i was trying not to use you know frivolously because yeah. they're so expensive and that was grayed out in the menu and i couldn't use that either and there's a there's a save option on the main menu which also uses your schnapps when you when you save it that way, but it was also grayed out and it said you cannot save during this activity. So I thought, okay, well, maybe it's the mission that I'm on. So I continued doing it, except I wasn't checking off objectives anymore. I was going through entire missions at that point, you know, and it's an endless series of missions. And so I, you know, I was like three hours at that point. I was like, okay, well, maybe there was a, there was a side mission that I had started oh, and no. it's just running in the background and that's screwing everything up. So I did a couple side missions and at some point, you know, at that point it's like, the longer I keep playing, the more I'm just going to have to eat it when I finally reload my last save. And so it was 3.30 in the morning at this point oh. and my last save was from 11.30 and I just had to kiss a goodbye. Mwah. Okay, what about... For people that will be listening to this podcast a year and a half down the road, time traveling, right? And they're like, maybe if it's patched up, is there the potential of having a cool experience here? Yeah, uh, it's cool. It is still challenging and slow, but in a way that I think works and makes for an interesting experience. Because the whole idea of it is it's an open world Skyrim style RPG but without the magic and rooted in our actual real world history. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it tries to put you in what life would be like in a, as a peasant in the medieval world. Little Henry. Yeah. And, and so go figure that's not the most exciting world. And set it, piece moments are not uh, just flowing over uh, you. It tries to do some set piece moments <laughs> and they turn out really. That had some of the biggest problems for me. Turn the butter, um, Henry. But yeah, so so your progress, you know, as a character and kind of in combat and your other skills is slow. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. If okay. if the if you know the premise of the game and the setting and you like that kind of history, if all that speaks to you, then it's worth devoting the time to progressing through it. And a larger story goes some places? Yeah, it does. And I would say that it it does a better job with its actual campaign storytelling than any Elder Scrolls game has wow. before. Because for as much as I love all those games, I never played them for the story. And not. your character is always an empty vessel, you know, who's predestined for greatness. And in this one, you are playing a very specific character they have lots of cutscenes that kind of lay everything out, you know, and it's, you know, some of the characters are fictional, but it's kind of following historical events. Okay. Uh, and so that was all really interesting to me. Some of some of the missions that you go on get really weird. Let's go. How weird. Uh, at one point, I accidentally had an orgy with a priest. 
Accidentally? Yes, I didn't know it was going to happen. An accident. Uh, it's all orgies. And by the by the point it sin. happened, uh, there was no turning back. But that was on the night that I lost four hours of progress, so that was washed away. And I just I like made the different sins de- of that priest. Yep, I made different <laughs> decisions uh, when I played through it the second time. But. Yeah, I think I said I don't know if Kotaku wrote that article where it's like it's tough not to f people in that game. Is it kind of a Mass Effect style thing? We're just having a conversation. All of a sudden, it's like, wait, our clothes are falling off. I I, th- I think it it is that moment specifically where you okay. don't realize that it's going to lead to that. But otherwise, <laughs> I wasn't effing anybody else accidentally. So so it's so tough I mean we talked about it a couple weeks ago on the podcast and it seemed like uh, we talked for a little while about it just feels like a cult classic in the making do you feel like that holds true are there going to be a large swath of fans for this game for years and years because it's just such a unique thing sure I think there are going to be those fans but you would have to be blind to excuse the amount of problems unless you know some people may not have problems I wrote a thing on the save feature earlier that they just need a system that lets you save at any time. And PC Modders added that pretty much immediately yeah, after awesome. its release. Yeah. Um, and s- some people in that in the comments section of that said that they weren't running into problems, which I suspect some of them was because they haven't played as much, because my first 10 hours were actually pretty good. Oh, okay. And one of my earliest impressions was, this is like the Elder Scrolls games, but less buggy. And that <laughs> totally flipped on its head later oh, on. Wow. Kind of the... La- the Further you get the, you can tell the polish really ran out. It felt like you were scared to play it every time. Yes. <laughs> because and, it was going to be some nightmare. And it's not just save bugs. Like, can you explain some other things besides just the save bugs? Uh, I mean, getting stuck in random geometry. I got stuck in bushes. My horse got stuck on a rock. And then when I got off the horse, I got stuck on the rock. And the horse kind of crushed me because <laughs> the collision... The collision with your horse, especially if he's if he comes up anywhere near you, it hurts you. And so I kind of just got stuck there and immediately died. Hey, that's the priest job, right, sir? <laughs> uh, I had entire quest lines break down where they were just broken and I couldn't progress anymore. So you have to reload on those. I had one in particular that broke because I had to talk to a guy and he was with a guard, an NPC guard, and I had to talk to him alone. But that guard was with them the entire time. And so at night, they were supposed to go to their room in the inn to sleep, except only the guard was going there because there was an old man sleeping in the other bed. And so that didn't bother the guard, apparently. But so when I talked to the guy that I was supposed to talk to, he said, are you Carl by any chance? And the guy's name is Carl. So he said yes. And my guy said, great. I've been, I can't wait to talk to you. And then it just, the conversation ended, and there wasn't any option to speak to him anymore, and the objective was just broken from that point on. And you're on. just slowly looking around the room? Like, yeah, <laughs> like, uh, the only option was to pickpocket him at that point. Well, okay. But the reason it was broken was because that old guy was an NPC from a previous quest that had also broken, uh, because you can ask him for help to, to uh, oh. kind of make your way through a, ca- a cave full of bandits. Yeah. Uh, but if you do that, he charges in blindly and immediately gets killed anyway. <laughs> and so I, I went through it. I actually managed to get through it with him alive. But then after the cutscene, it went to an infinite loading screen. Yeah. So that save was also just broken. And the only way I got through it was by not talking to him in the first place and leaving him in the tavern. But that broke the mission after that because... He just hung around the tavern for forever at that point and continued to go to bed in the or go to sleep in that one bed, which stopped the other guy from going in there and that broke that quest. So they kind of sometimes it compounds and screws things up in weird ways that you can't predict. And so again, the solution is to always be saving your progress as best as you can. Which is limited. Yes. Holy Lord, maybe Kingdom don't come yet. Yeah. This is the tough thing. It's like, what are we going to do? Check back on this game in a couple of years and be like, okay, now it's okay, people. But maybe, I, maybe I really hope it. they're able to fix it faster than that. Yeah. And uh, like I said, there are problems with just the way that the AI acts sometimes too. Yeah. And there are so many problems that, you know, I can't recommend it to anyone at this point. I yeah. mean, I guess if you're super patient and it interests you, just know what you're getting into. Because I, like I said, I played for over 100 hours, I don't even want to guess at how much progress I lost, because literally, almost every single time where I thought, like, 
uh, I don't have to save in between these two objectives. Something would go wrong <laughs> and I'd get stuck and I'd lose that save and feel like an idiot for, you know, not taking the minute and a half to fast travel yeah. to because the fast travel system isn't actually that fast. You have to watch your across. icon go. Yeah. And so, but it's worth it to just go and save yeah. if the game doesn't break and disable saving as well. It's okay, Jeff. I'm you're done. Yeah. Shh, it's okay. Shh, 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 shh. It, it is disappointing because, like, like I said, the story was interesting to me. I liked the idea. I don't understand how we don't have more games that are set in an actual real world historical setting yeah. and try and let you experience that. And right. as as a role playing game, you know that is a super interesting premise. Okay, Jeff. Um, I wish you the best. I wish you can play so much Into the Breach that your mind just explodes it, and your heart melts. Yeah, it, it was a nice palate cleanser <laughs> oh over the night. God. Speaking of cleansing palates for the listeners and viewers, Surio mm -hmm. Vasquez, Metal Gear Survive. Yeah. Another one we talked a little bit about on the podcast and said, uh, let's wait we'll for the see. final verdict. Yeah. Now you've seen credits roll. Yep. And I played all, several more hours after that. I Wow. Okay. Very impressive. What is your final verdict on Metal Gear Survive? Uh, like, are you looking for a score? Give me that score, dude. A six. I gave six. it a six. Okay. Why did it get a six? How did it change? Because I think it was last week, I guess, when we talked about it, I think we're both kind of on the same page of, like, there's something here. It's opaque. Yeah. It's confusing. I'm digging through the dirt trying to find an interesting game in this mess. Mm -hmm. Did you just keep digging for your entire I, time playing I it? I think my impression is sort of like a more... I feel like it is similar, but it, it feels like more grounded in the idea of just, I think the game wants you to engage with loops that I don't think are very interesting uh, yeah. the, the, the more you do them. So I think that f there has been, mo you know, before we released, it was mostly like, you know, you know, screw Konami. They're like terrible. I can't believe this product even exists. Right. And I think at this point, there's sort of been a little bit of backlash of like, this game's actually pretty cool. And I, I, to some degree, I see that game of just yeah. here's here's a cool co-op thing where you can play, you know, Metal Gear Solid Five with your friends and sort of fend off waves of zombies. And you know, the single camp play, the single uh, player is actually like feels fun. And the 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 detail, which is sort of the dust area area where you have to sort of keep track of your oxygen and, and your running is very limited, um, extremely limited. Right. So you basically run for like ten seconds and then you're yeah. done. Uh, it like that part I think feels good, right? In a way that it's like the shooting is all like everything works well. It is Metal Gear Solid right. Five, but I think that pretty much all of the periphery systems around that sort of struggle to find like, they they struggle to find the balance of making that stuff feel like an obstacle to overcome and just sort of making them overbearing. Uh, so so it just uh, becomes not fun to play in the end. Yeah. So like they have this base building mechanic, which I think some people will be, like. I'm not a big base building guy in general, but like there are there's interesting stuff, stuff where eventually you start uh, you know cultivating farms and you can capture animals. So like right in my current base, I have like a bear and like a couple zebras and it's cute. And it's weird because they they at first they just fed me milk, like they they would give you like a regular supply of milk, but then eventually they started giving me meat. And I'm not sure where that meat comes from hmm. because it's the, the sheep and the bears remain in their cages, but meat suddenly appears. I'm not sure how that happens. <laughs> uh, but so by the time you get that stuff up and running, you only have like six crew members by the end of the, like by the end of the game. I really only had like six crew members and sort of like the beginnings of a base. And then it says, OK, now you can, you know, play this game for as long as you want, you know, keep, keep building up <laughs> Stay your Stay in detail forever. Right. Or... Like, well, cause they, they, at the end of the campaign, they sort of tease out another thread. It's like, maybe if you keep playing, you'll, you like this other thing might happen. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to spoil what it is, but, yeah. uh, so basically like once you beat the game, your loop is basically like sleep for 12 hours and then wake up and have a bunch of missions happen, uh, like appear to you from your crew members. Yeah. So it, if you're just looking for sort of a, a regular single player game, there's like those systems feel underdeveloped by the time you finish it. And so if you want to keep engaging with those systems, all you really have to do is just sleep for 12 hours, which drains a lot of your hunger and thirst and wait for randomly generated missions to basically pop up and give you more stuff. And that's sort of the other problem is that this game's rewards are basically just more materials. Uh, and there are there is gear like there is rare gear that you can get from you know from completing uh, co-op stages but even that stuff drops broken and so you have to spend resources to fix them so even 
and they they deteriorate very quickly and the the amount of resources you have is super expensive uh, like to to maintain them is super expensive to the point where i saw okay how much is it going to cost to fix this weapon versus to craft another one and they were almost the same so just the the amount of resources you have to farm just to engage with the fun parts of the game yeah is way it just feels so weighted against against sort of the idea of just having fun and more against like just keep doing this loop over and over and over again it just it's such a dickish game i've kind of i've cooled on it quite a bit just yeah. trying to play more because i want i want to like it i like survival aspects yeah. in games i love Metal Gear solid 5 but it's just such a bummer just trying to rescue these dumbass npcs that are bleeding out all over the place mm -hmm. after like four tries on this effing thing i dragged this npc who's bleeding out had them on the teleporter and then it's like all right now you got 40 seconds to defend it and it's just waves of wanderers running around with their heads off screaming yeah and so i'm fighting off those guys Finally do that, clock gets down to zero, and just as the clock gets to zero, it zooms in on the NPC. And they die. And they're dead! Yeah. I thought it was zooming in because I reached zero. Yeah. It was right there. Yeah. It's just a constant kick in the nuts. It just seems like there's... It, it feels like it wants to be sort of this game where all these different systems are colliding with each other, but they every time they collide, it just feels like it's to your detriment of just like <laughs> you're... You are, this, the, these systems are colliding just to, just to screw you over, basically. And it, it never feels like... It never feels like it gets off the ground. It feels like you're just waiting for the good parts to come. And that, yeah. In the story that... like There's one interesting thread that I mentioned... Uh, last time, but like that threat doesn't resolve like with any interesting satisfaction. Sir, at all. I'm very curious to talk to you about the story, but I don't want to spoil it for people that yeah. are actually playing it. So, can we record it, just like talk about the story, and we'll put it in the very, very end of this podcast? There'll be time code on the sure. YouTube or, or audio version because I'm very curious just for okay. you to, to let her rip on all that, I mean, all that do, stuff. I mean, do Tack or Jeff and Carol? They're, they're, they're barely spoil. awake right now. They don't care. <laughs> I think I'll script. survive. Uh, 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 what do you think about the crazy, like, you know, a lot of people ran with the story. I forget if we posted on our site or not. That's mm -hmm. like, oh, there's a secret Kojima Productions forever yeah. uh, message in this. Like, people are reading into Metal Gear Survive and looking for hidden messages the way they look at, like, what tweets Melania Trump favorites. You know, like, oh, what you really think. It's yeah. just like this weird cult. Do you think there's anything interesting there? I, I don't think so. Just because I think they are, there is that histor historical allusion to the Philadelphia experiment of, like, here's this weird thing that happened that, you know, messed with people. Uh but like, so the one interesting. Hang on, hang on, just to be clear. Okay. We're not doing that audio bit for the end right now. Okay. Oh, <laughs> we'll save that. I, okay, I thought no, we were we'll recording. save that. All right. I don't know. But just like, do you do you take any? Do you believe in that crazy conspiracy theory about the secret messages in this game? I about mean, like, save us, Kojima. We love you. Come back, Papa. I'm sure. I'm sure at some point, like they they decided to add that stuff. But I just don't. I I don't know that I necessarily super buy into the idea of just like. This team is constantly crying out for help. I don't like. It's don't it's, it's an easy storyline, but like, yeah, sure. I, mean, I think of like the very beginning, like the hospital sequence in Phantom Pain. There were like posters on the wall where it's like, "Come work for Kojima Productions." Like referencing Kojima Productions yeah. in these games like, is not I, I, outlandish. I, I don't think that that stuff is you know not there or anything. I, I'm sure that at some point it's like you know that'd be a nice touch. Like we yeah. used to we used to work at this other company. I think it's it's it'd be nice for us to sort of honor that company in a way. But I don't think this is I'm like saying help us like <laughs> like I, I don't think that's what, what that is the worst game is a cry for help <laughs> exactly here's a, a crazy thought as well yeah if you had the two buttons right here mm -hmm. two massive buttons slam on either one one said there's never mm, there's no metal gear game for the next seven years versus another button that says metal gear survive 2 would you slam that button for the sequel uh Gun to head. <laughs> Gun to head, Gun would to you head. slam that button? I mean, is the other option that the, the that other Metal Gear game is, you know, in any way good? I don't know. Seven years away, though. That's a crap shoot. The, the core of it, though, Surreal, is like, isn't there... Like you said, there's good yes, things in there, it. There's a core... Like, like, sorry. Uh, the, there is a core here that I think can be expanded on. And I even think they can do it in this game. I, oh, I really? Think, I think that... Because a lot of my issues with this game is just number tweaking. Of just like if they can lighten up on how restrictive a lot of the resources are, if they can add more stages to the co-op, because that's another issue. Is like you run the same missions over and over again, uh, and they sort of tighten up a lot of the quality of life issues. Like 
you you can have multiple ammo kinds of ammo for your weapons, but when you run out of one, you don't automatically switch to the other, and you have to sort of go through a menu while you're playing, you know, fending off waves of zombies just to switch ammo types. Just just a lot of stuff like that. Um, I think they can turn this game into something a, a lot better than what it is. Interesting. But, but I at this point, I don't know that I trust Konami to do that. Because yeah. I, I, I imagine like they're just going to abandon it at some point. Yeah. It doesn't for, do well. for the limited resources that you keep on talking about, can you buy them with real money? You can buy basically XP boosters that'll give you more supplies. And the other thing, mm. the other thing, the extra really terrible thing is that so once you beat the game, you can sort of set up a, 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 a machine at your base that will summon waves of zombies, but will give you a lot of resources. But the, the thing is that waves, like between waves, you have to wait 12 or 24 hours, like actual real time hours between waves. So sometimes you'll play a, a mission at, you know, and it'll end at 6 p.m. and it says, well, you'll have to be here at 6 a.m. for the next wave. Or you can just pay us money to, to have it happen right now or basically what? to give you coins. And that is, so and you get like a daily allotment of these coins, but it's like you get like maybe 10 coins or something and you need like 200 just to activate sort of this this time skip basically. And the one time I did use it from like because I had amassed a bunch of them, like it, it still said you're, it's still two hours away. So, like the amount of waiting you have to do, it just feels like a it feels like a console version of a mobile of a mobile like free sure. to play game in a lot Premium. of ways. So, oh, what about that crazy save slots thing where you have to yeah, pay you have, extra you have 10 to bucks. pay basically ten bucks to buy another character to play as, which I don't know why you would do that because like at some point you ju you can just level up all the classes and that's another thing like the the classes in this game are all saved for the end of the game. You cannot unlock your sub your secondary class until you beat the game and you're thirty hours into it, which is. Again, they want you to sort of engage with these end game loops, yeah. but those loops aren't interesting after the end of the game because what what are you building all of these incredible weapons for after you've already beaten the final boss? Like it doesn't, it, it just mm. it feels like a pointless end game in a lot of ways. Ugh. So which button button are you hitting? I think that we'll probably wait on Metal Gear for a while. It's just it seems like... let her rest. Yeah, it's yeah. Oh, I just specifically like I would want them to fix survive and not make not sort of turn around a sequel. Like, you know, in two years. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, it's so weird looking at, like, Konami's lineup of games, what they're working on. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they still have uh, Pro Evo, mm -hmm. which is huge and whatnot, the soccer game. And then I was looking at the lineup. It's like, last year in Japan, they released... Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh, there we go. Oh, don't forget, uh, there's uh, Super Bomberman R yeah. uh, for, the, for the Switch. And also, last year in Japan, they released a game called Bomber Girls. Which is a variation of Bomberman, but it's starring like sexy anime ladies, <laughs> and it seems sure. like it's in arcades only. But like, this is where you're at, Konami. You own Sunset Riders. Do something. Do Sunset something. Riders survive. Are you sure you wanted to do something? I'll with take it? Sunset Riders survive. Okay. Hell yeah, let's turn into a That's battle right. royale, side-scrolling battle how about, royale. How about a mobile game? <laughs> I'm listening. I'll take anything. Anything. Hold square to bury me, bury me with my money. It's a it's a tap <laughs> mobile game that you have to wait twelve hours between actions. You still want it? <laughs> bury me with my microtransactions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Konami! Uh, like Jeff, do you want anything from Konami? If you could, if you could demand one thing. No, I'm kind of in the disillusion camp at this point. That whatever they're gonna do, uh, it's not gonna be what people want. Forever. You're just ruling out Konami forever. I mean, it, it seems like they don't care anymore at this point. You know, are they taking any feedback to heart about what they're doing? It seems like Pro Evo is a cash cow. Yeah. And that that team knows what they're doing. And so they're fine with that. And everything else feels really freemium, schemey kind yeah. of how can we get the most money out of this? And who cares about the gameplay at this point? Yeah. At, at the same time, like, I, I Metal Gear is a cash cow for them, and I think sort of the sort of the prolonged and kind of like you know uh, development stories of, of Metal Gear Solid Five. I think there is a way that they could you know continue doing new Metal Gears. Like the thing I want most out of them is just a, a remake of the original Metal Gear. They just MSX Metal Gear. Yeah, the MSX Metal Gear of just round out that story, make it play, you know, rebuild it. And I feel like that that is that feels to me like a way they could just honor sort of their legacy and just say, hey, we are being slavish to the story. We're rebuilding it with Metal Gear Solid V's gameplay or whatever. And they'd and, sell a gajillion. And also, right, like, they it wouldn't be that long. big. Even if, like, yeah. you know, if you rebuild that game in 3D and don't expand on it in a huge way, it could be a, you know, couple-hour game. Yeah. Like, that's fine. People just want to see it. Or think about the fact that these loons, they made all those crazy cutscenes from Metal Gear Solid 3 for the pachinko game in the Fox engine. It looks mm -hmm. amazing. And it's like, in theory, the Metal Gear Solid 3 is just sitting around halfway done. That pachinko 
totally sums up Konami at this point for me. Yeah. Of like, that's what they want. Gambling that you just continue to spend money on. They'll make cutscenes for that, sure. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But but do they have do they have the artistic dr- vision or drive to you know even remake a game that you know they actually need people who care about the project to right. make it not suck and it, to just sell it once to you and you, you bring know? up artistic vision which is an interesting point I mean if Konami was led by a robot and I'm not saying it is yeah. not yet not yet but right. if it is like is it just they're crunching the numbers and maybe they're 100 percent correct and a rage isn't at Konami it's just the overall industry and where people are spending money and it's like hey they're a company quit faulting them for trying to make money at, at the same time like at the same time though like i can't look at milk and, and look at sort of the transaction the microtransactions and then just say like no yeah it's they're you know they got to make money like it's 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 a it is a detriment to the experience to to have to to have to deal with that stuff yes you're hurting fans yeah and give Ouch. us a new Sunset Riders. Exactly. Is it too much exactly. to ask? Uh, give us a, a Metal Gear Solid 5 remake of Sunset Riders. Yes! <laughs> Sunset Riders and the Fox Engine. <laughs> exactly. It's right there. Oh, yuck. Okay, so score again, Metal Gear Survive? Six. Six. Big, lousy six. Jeff, um, do you want to go feel better about your day and clap out of here, buddy? I do. Okay. I'm ready. Love you. Bye. See you later. Kyle Hilliard, welcome to the show, man. Hey, it's me. We're really doing the full rotation. Someday, I think it'd be really fun to, like heavy trippy ass gi show where we get every, every editor. former editor on wouldn't mm. that be fun i think it'd be great and just like keep clapping and we just like slowly rotate down the line <laughs> or just like let everybody host five minutes of the show wouldn't that be really fun you're just trying to get out of hosting duties <laughs> please for love of god <laughs> free me from this nightmarish prison no i love it um it, it speaking kind of, of nightmarish prison or we could just have one without transitions where it's just like as we cut to different camera angles different editors are just randomly every, just mm. make it as confusing as possible oh you're right kind of just like yeah treat it like uh, oh treat it like they treat Janet on Good Place yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah just, just like always appears out of nowhere yeah, yeah there's no special sure. effect to it she's just there these also. are all really good suggestions for the audio listeners <laughs> uh, Dan Tech uh, hey. now that we have Kyle here I wanted to get your take on uh, Corner Trigger on Steam as the PC editor, do you recommend this version no. of Chrono Trigger? No, it's, it's just a mobile port, right? Yeah. Like, even worse than that is from what I've heard. I haven't actually played it, uh, but, like... I don't know about worse than that. It's like just extra seeing extra filters that, and... Well, seeing it on a big-ass screen, it is such a bummer. So they finally, out of the blue, so it, brought Chrono Trigger to Steam, and it's the mobile version. To the point that, like, the UI is on the screen at directly, all times. Directly stripped from the mobile one. It's absurd. So, like, it's... It's, it's, it's really sad. Like, it, one of the best games of all time. No doubt, right? Like, yeah. And then this is the treatment it gets. Well, sweet. And coming right <laughs> off the heels of Secret of Mana, which I, there are maybe some defenders out there of the remake. At least they tried to do something with the remake. Uh, th- of there was of Mana. effort there, whether it was good or not. There was effort. And this is just bare bottom. Bottom of the barrel. Like, okay, Dan, seriously... The amount of effort it takes, uh, I know you're not a programmer, to I'm put not. Secret of Mana, the iPhone version, which also just has ugly looking UI and text. Oh, I'm aware. I've, I'm a constant, uh, you know, I've played some of Square's Steam ports of the mobile games, like yeah. Final Fantasy IV. Right. Or these, these other disgusting, you know, ports of the, of the, the mobile games. It's just like, man... And it sucks because like, they're great games that I'd love to play on and PC. And some port Square gets right. I mean, like all the Final Fantasy games ported over to, to Steam. I think like the been PlayStation great so far. ones, right? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. PlayStation 2 and, and whatnot. Even like yeah. 15 seems to be okay. I'm talking the, the earlier ones with the yeah. chunky monkey graphics. We need those chunky they're, monkeys. They're, they're no good. Okay, but just but anyway. think about this. So the number of sales they're going to get with this now mostly negative reviewed version of Chrono Trigger I mean, on they, Steam. They rolled it out. Surprise. So hopefully people, you know, I'm sure the... It, it potentially the intent was to get it before people could give it better reviews, right? Because it's, it's hey, it's here. But the question is, right, trigger best game a <laughs> year a year down the road, right? Yeah. If they release this one, what are those sales figures looking like versus sales numbers for like here's the straight beautiful Super Nintendo version? I don't know. I wish we had that version. Give yeah, I know. Version. But hypothetically, what are the numbers? Man, uh, I'd assume that most people would want to have that. But the I go. guess the, que- the question that you're <laughs> asking not, though is like a... the PC. The, there are people who are going to buy that, yeah. and be turned off, and it does you know uh, per, when from it comes. Living. Let's say <laughs> let's say that like a really a good port comes out. Yeah. they're like they've already got their Chrono Trigger fill, and it was really disappointing. I don't know if they buy that. one I guess now, so. I'm just trying to know? figure out like what's the incentive for the company to do this right mm. versus just do bare bottom gross ass version, well, right? Because no one wants to play it. Uh, yeah, what do you mean? What's it, the incentive? Would it sell three times as much? That's what oh. I'm trying to figure out. Sure. 
I don't know. I feel That's like they tough. went into this with the F, with like this is just going to be a, a low effort port. They didn't promote it at all. It was a surprise release. They they like with those fantasy, you know, those PlayStation era ports. They had to do some work to get to actually make them because they. I don't think uh, any of them were on mobile before this, were they? Mobile like seven, eight, nine. God, I those think are they are. I think okay. they are. Yeah. yeah. But I imagine that like those took a little bit more work, right? And so they promoted them. So like this feels like. You know, let's 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 do this as low effort as possible, yeah. just to say we've done it. It's a good question though, because like if they did commit a lot of resources to it, I, would they make a lot of ROM. resources? Yeah, so I'm just thinking of from Square Enix perspective. Like some idiot you know? hacker made a ROM of this that runs on an emulator in yeah. 1997. You, you know think, what I mean? Like they just loaded that entire ROM. It's like, oh, it crashed. We're gonna have to fix a bug. Well, I guess we we have the iOS ROM. Let's just use that one instead. Fuck it. It's uh, stupid. Ugh. Do you? Th I mean, I I wonder if the value of this game is not gonna come later when someone just mods it to say like. Here's the actual version you wanted. <laughs> just mod Remove it. the filters that are gross as right, hell. Right, because it's yeah. like it's just filters and and interface stuff that is just really terrible. <laughs> interface right? and, stuff. And some is some of the rough. like the graphics are kind of misaligned or something. I don't so know if they I, opened it up to Steam Workshop, I, but that'd be nice. I can't imagine. Well, I mean, you could just download, you know, like a non non licensed mod. Uh, whoa. Whoa. whoa, I'm just saying, whoa, whoa, buddy. Do you, buddy. Uh, do you think people are going to go through through the effort of doing that? I don't know. No, they'll just play the ROM. Yeah, I like. Yeah. That's it's oh, so much easier. Like, cause the the you gotta make, if you're gonna do a port, you gotta give people incentive to not steal the original version of the game, you know. That's and that's not here. There's a YouTube comment that sums it up perfectly, saying, uh, "In this version of Chrono Trigger, I'm rooting for Lavos." <laughs> <laughs> that's really do you good. think? Do you think this this port was part of why like Chrono Trigger just the fuel of conspiracies? Why this wasn't on this in this classic? Oh my God! <laughs> so we got something in our back pocket. <laughs> you can't say that out loud. People will riot in the streets. The city will tear uh, itself yeah. apart. It's like now we can, we can release this on its own. Well, it just bums me out to think like you know I was hoping for a standalone release of Chrono Trigger on Switch, but now it's like if they release this version <laughs> of Chrono Trigger on Switch. I'm going to rip out my tongue and chuck it at Square's headquarters. <laughs> Who's with me? Uh, but the, the moral of the story is just go get a 3DS and the DS version <sighs> of Chrono Trigger. Yeah, that, that, that yes. seems to be the one. Because I've never finished Chrono Trigger, so I actually was I was the perfect marker for this of like, you know, I've played Chrono Trigger for like two hours and kind of bounced off of it. And I, I wanted to finish it. But, you know, hearing that this version is This is terrible. not the one to play. Yeah. yeah. Don't so, do it, Serial. I don't know. I, I'll have to dig out my DS copy of it. But hey, Final Fantasy VII Remake coming soon. It's going to be great. Looking yeah. forward to it. Uh, <laughs> it's hey. going to be the iOS version, actually. Square Enix, really. They know how to remake their games. Let me tell you. <laughs> Kyle, let's finally talk about PlayStation VR, this GD finally. podcast. Yeah. GD, GI show. Uh, Moss. Moss. In VR. Simple name. Yeah, from PolyArc. There we go. So you control a little mouse, you run around, you, you solve puzzles. What are you doing? Yeah, you're platforming, solving puzzles. There's a little combat in there. It's like simple combat combos like you just kind of do like you know three hits move out of the way three hits move out of the way it's pretty simple um, but it's fun it moves really well the character that you play as quill which is a little mouse is awesome like she looks really great and her really? animation is like fantastic like you i said would, you said second best to last guardian i know and i i was because i was thinking of like when was the last time i saw like an animal that moved this well in a video game and, and that Dan was lumbered into the office yeah. this morning right buddy <laughs> What? <laughs> Sorry, but I really, it's really good. Like it's really impressive. Uh, the animation for her and she moves really well. And uh, it's a good puzzle platformer. And I like the sort of VR implementation. What uh, is it? The VR implementation. So you, like it's you, pl you are technically in the game. Like you are the reader. Uh, the idea is like you're reading a storybook. And and like it, on reflective surfaces, you can even see yourself like present in the game. You're kind of this like ghostly sort of masked figure and quill will interact with you sometimes like she'll point to you and like point to puzzles and you can even give her high fives sometimes when you like solve puzzles and stuff like that um but as far as like what you're doing is you're really just sort of looking down at her and and playing like a third person platformer action game um and then you can kind of look around corners to find secrets and stuff like that and then there is some motion controls to solve puzzles that are kind of inconsistent like all motion controls like i always kind of had a little bit of trouble with that but uh, Control and Quill felt great. So, really? Yeah. What did you end up scoring this thing? 775. Is it one of those games that's nice to have if you own a PlayStation VR, or would you ever recommend this is the PSVR experience to have? Um, I It's not It's not a run out and get a PSVR, but absolutely, yeah. if you have a PlayStation VR, this should definitely be in your library. It's going to be one of the biggest games or most interesting games you can play on that I thing. I think so, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Right on. Um, let's see. There's also got uh, Dantec Fable Fortune was released on Steam. And Xbox. Yeah. And Xbox. That's, That's right. right. Uh, we have a new Gameplay Today video of you diving into the mechanics. We do. Overall, you seem positive, but not... I, I'm positive on it. Okay. It's just like the digital card game scene is 
There are lots of choices. Yeah. And I don't know what it's going to take to make Fable Fortune your choice over games that already are out there. So it's going to have a it's going to have a difficult time trying to elbow its way into the market. Yeah, for sure. Is it funny? Is it funny? Funny how? Like Fable? Is it like a clown? <laughs> I, mean, I think I, I like for. I like the sense of humor of Fable. I was just wondering if that uh, appears plop in the, the card cards game down. I guess there, there's more sometimes. humor than like a grimdark fantasy game, I guess. But okay. like it's it's not uh, it's not excessively jovial in tone. <laughs> Is there sort of like some <laughs> sort of hook that separates jovial. this from like you know Hearthstone or Gwent? Or there there are mechanics that do make it uh, different. So the morality system is in play. So you go good or bad during the course mm. of the game. And that will affect a lot of how your cards work. Uh, and there's, there's a it, there are minor nuances, but they're they're big enough to to separate itself. Yeah. Can so you go. get in the middle of a crowd of people and fart? No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but you will grow old as you play the game. So oh. that sounds fun. <laughs> Fable Fortune, everybody. In real time. Yeah. Alta's Odyssey also came out on iOS. Yeah. Uh, it is the sand-based sequel. To uh, Alto's Adventure. Which I didn't play it. Alto's Adventure. Oh, it's cool. I it's kind of, I mean, it, Endless Runner is probably a weird way to describe it, but you're going down a hill. It looks gorgeous. Yeah. Look at a trailer. You know, if you want like a nice premium iOS experience, it seems all right. More interesting, though, is how Laboratory, the, the Kirby Masterminds, the studio that cranks out six games a year and no one seems to care, is <laughs> how Laboratory. All, uh, they're uh, all pretty consistent, too. They're not bad. No, yeah, exactly. They're, all, they're all great. And so they have a new subset within the studio called Hal Egg. Mm-hmm. where they're releasing iOS games. And they released one, which is a great name, called Part-Time UFO. Yeah. What do you think of this, Kyle? Uh, it's cute. It's uh, it's cool. You're basically, it's just a crane game. It's, UFO catcher, is they yeah, call them. Yeah, so you're a little UFO, and use the touchscreen to kind of control it and pick things up and put them in other places. Like, the game opens with you, like, this farmer has, like, his truck overturned, and you got to put all the oranges back in his truck. And then after you, after you complete it, he picks up his hat and gives you, uh, like a book of jobs available for you. It's like, oh, you're new to this planet. Why don't you take on some of these jobs? But uh, it's 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 got that weird, like, how art style, and it's bizarre. It's got cool Maybe. music. Yeah, more bizarre, I think, than anything Hal has made artistically. Like, the presentation is really what sets yeah. this game apart. At the core, the gameplay is just using a little crane game like arm, yeah. picking up things, moving them, stacking them. I and mean, I think the gameplay, it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's it can be a little frustrating. Yeah. But, but, but it, is, it is really nice when you complete something, like stacking cheerleaders up into a pyramid, like pulling okay. that off is like, oh, man, I did it. I got the balance right. But more than the you know balance of the cheerleaders, it's seeing the pixelated expressions on the cheerleaders' faces as you're yeah. picking them up. Like, it's just Charm City. And the music, it is like this chibi Rayman esque take on like oh brother art thou soundtrack yeah it's that's just right, yeah. surreal is it like it's the, got the, some vocalization from your descriptions yeah. this is giving me like a rhythm heaven warioware kind of vibe is it's that, more like yeah. last of us have we been doing a bad uh, job yeah. oh. <laughs> i mean there's no there's no rhythm to it but, but like the art the style and the weirdness of it yeah definitely rhythm okay. heaven like i love when because what happens is when you finish the like your your mission to stack stuff uh it kind of gives you this like a drum roll to see if everything will stay balanced and like like you said everyone nearby will have like crazy expressions like oh my yeah. god is it gonna work and then it like clicks in it That's so it's, it's fun it's cool yeah uh part-time ufo is the name of the game it's just fun to see old time old timey japanese studios like game freak makes a lot of they're starting to make more and more just weird experimental side offshoots and i love a studio that's been around as long as hell and designed the first Smash Brothers games. For yeah. Classic. Um, them making these weird little experiments off to the side away from the normal beat. It's interesting. It's like, it seems like it comes from the same place as like a box box boy. Yeah. Who's, who is a, has a cameo in the game actually. Oh really? Yeah. He's in the start screen sitting there in the corner. Oh, that's awesome. Box boy and iOS technically. And they don't smooth out the pixels, which is real nice. <laughs> Thank God. Dan, I think this podcast is going pretty smooth. Uh, as soon as box box boy got in there. That's what's wrong? What's wrong? in the upturn. What's now. your problem? Oh, you like box box boy. Do I? I thought you were going to sh** all over Box Box Boy. And I was... Do I? Holy Lord. All right, let's get to emails, everybody, so we can make sense of Dan Tech. Emails coming up. And welcome back to the Informer Show. We have some great emails here that people send to the podcast at GameInformer.com. You know how this works. You can write anything you want. We prefer questions, feedback, words of wisdom, thoughts, news stories, insight, education, whatever you want. Anything that, Serial? Makes the makes show, the show better. better. Makes the show better. He said me, not you, Kyle. I wanted to be a chorus. Okay. You send it into podcastinginformer.com. We read off all these entries, choose our absolute favorite, and then ship them out something very nice. This week, it's Dan Tech's Sense of Humor. Mm. I thought it was something very nice. Yeah. <laughs> 
That um, implies we, that he found it at some point to ship it out. So Yeah, I don't think FedEx takes empty boxes. <laughs> But it does take box, box boy. <laughs> hey, punchlines. Uh, I forgot to mention in the beginning that uh, Elise also reviewed a game called Where the Water Tastes Like Wine. Artsy fartsy storytelling game. Uh, it seems lovely, though. She gave it a nine. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about it next week uh, in theory. But I looked at a trailer and it was like a wolf in a wall of text. So <laughs> You have to like invade a cult. Is that that game? I don't know. No. I don't no. know. That's a, game. that's a different game? Okay. Yeah, where the Never water mind. tastes like it's wine. It's the sequel to Red Dead Redemption, actually. Anyways, we encourage people to check it out. Uh, read Elise's review on GameFormer.com. Should be a good time. Also, speaking of reminders, before we get to the, the meaty emails that are stacked up here, um, Leo and I, we talked a lot about the hashtag GI Show Challenge. I don't know if you're familiar, Kyle, with the hashtag GI Show Challenge. Oh, I listened to the show, Hanson. Oh, thank you so much. We talked about it a lot, and it was like, how do we boil it down? How do we communicate this effectively? Because it's kind of a complicated thing to get across. And I thought we did a solid 8 out of 10 job in last week's show, but I think there's a lot of confusion when looking Zooms at, like... Zooms are worth two points. What is going a on? lot of people are, like, taking screenshots of their phone, you know, and then, like, uploading that picture, which is, I guess, okay-ish. But here's the idea. Here's what hashtag GI Show Challenge is like. Leo, hit it. Here's how this should go, right? We want to gamify you telling your friend about the Game Informer podcast. We want to say, hey, you should check out this game. You should subscribe, not this game, this podcast. That's why it's complicated <laughs> to explain this. You should subscribe to the GI Show on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to stuff. And then we have it. So if you take a picture of your phone, subscribe to the podcast, and any other phones also in that same picture, literally a picture of the phone, Subscribe to the podcast. Each phone in the picture, Dan, is worth one entry into a raffle. The winner of that raffle gets to be on an upcoming email section of the Game Informer Show podcast. And they also, can Skype in, probably, right? We can Skype them in. Zooms are worth two, naturally. So, what you do, get your friends to subscribe to the show. Take that picture with somebody's phone. It's complicated. How many phones can you get in that picture? Each one will up your chances of being on the show. It'll be a fun time. And you tweet it out. Hashtag GI Show Challenge picture of the phone subscribe to the podcast you can also email it in but we prefer you tweet it out what's confusing are we all all right i'm i, I get it. it i understand do you get it dan Tech? I, I get it w what are entries that you've been getting that feel like they don't meet that criteria well they're all great and we love every listener but it's a lot of screenshots of just their phone or it's like ah it's not really a picture per se and then also the one that i don't know how to factor in is someone made an animation of a phone subscribe to the game informer show and then it zooms out and it's like some weird ass trippy architect matrix room where there's like millions of phones. <laughs> so I don't know what to do with that. But so wait, amazing so do effort. Do videos count? No. So that okay. that that you should just kind of give like three or four. Probably. Just because probably. just for the effort, you know, they don't get one for the phones that they simulated. But I uh, guess. But hashtag GHO challenge. Tweet out a picture of phone subscribe to the podcast. The point is tell a friend we'd appreciate it dan we're here every week we live in your phone every week mm -hmm. we do also fun fact there's no ads on this podcast please tell a friend yeah that's, that's really cool you is that why about mattresses you don't have to skip 15 seconds forward mm -hmm. at any point yeah you don't yeah. gotta hear tell you about mark maron's monologue on this, <laughs> this meal supplement thing okay you guys ready to get to emails yes, yes. absolutely all right leo in the booth you ready to get to emails he seems He's ready. Yes. Oh, yes. Great. Oh, By the is. way, FedEx absolutely would take empty boxes. I don't know Okay, first email uh, says, Hey, on the previous episode of the Game Informer Show, Hansen made an egregious mistake that is so beneath him that I can't even believe I had to publicly shame him into correcting himself. In a segment talking about entrance songs, Hansen had a lapse of memory when trying to remember who wrote the Chicago Bulls entrance music. In a failed attempt to be affable, <laughs> thank you, he said the 70s hack, Dan Fogarty. What's the, what's the mistake here? There is no 70s hack named Dan Fogarty. Hanson conflated Creedence Clearwater Revival's frontman, John Fogarty, and his contemporary, Dan Fogelberg. I'm not saying reparations are in order, but an apology and resignation would be great. I understand. This is signed, John Fogarty from San Francisco, California. There was a fusion dance situation in, like, 1982. That I yeah, think. Steely Dan was probably my brain. <laughs> Turns out the guy who wrote the Chicago Bulls entrance music, which is amazing, was Alan Parsons who engineered oh. Dark Side of the Moon uh, and had a whole project devoted to him, right? Dan, yeah. what's your favorite Alan Parsons project song? I have no idea. Great. Time. All right. Time. 
There we go. I really messed it up. I'm sorry, everybody. He's not a hack. Uh, Mick from Maine. Great name. <laughs> says, I just recently finished watching your Extra Life charity stream from 2017. Oh, was that still going on? I hope not. <laughs> um, on your YouTube channel, and during which you played a game called City Shrouded in Shadows. Uh, so my question is, have you heard anything about a American release for that game? We it, haven't. Is that the one with where you're like a like a regular person in a city being attacked by kaiju? Yes. Oh, kaiju yeah, yeah. and a bunch of other like crazy licensed Ultraman, Ultraman is in there. Yeah. yeah, it was a cool game. If you want to check out footage of it, uh, we did it during Extra Life. You can find it that way. But we haven't heard anything. You're totally right. We should do... We should play it if Bring it ever comes it to the States again. Bring it west. Uh, Mick also says, I was wondering, is there a chance there might be a super replay of Disaster Report anytime down the road? Your replay of Raw Danger was a personal favorite along with the 3DO Spectaculars. Um, I don't know. Everything's possible. Well, we got Killer7 is happening at, tomorrow, I think. It's the first episode. Really? Depending on what you to us. And then God Hand after that. Cool. How's but Killer7 going so far? Serial's on that one. You're running the sticks? Yeah. Sweet. Um, I saw Leo laughing while looking at footage, so that's a good sign, right? He's nodding. He's uh, laughing at how bad it was. <laughs> like, I can't believe we're going to publish this. Steve this is and Serial's Iowa. favorite game? Yeah, number one game. Number one game. Killer7. With a bullet. With a bullet. With a bullet. Okay. Stephen Iowa <laughs> says, uh, hear me out on this, everybody. Hideo Kojima's Monster Hunter World Solid. <laughs> Imagine all the craziness of Metal Gear mixed into the world of Monster Hunter. I have news for you, Stephen Iowa. <laughs> If you played Peace Walker, you can literally fight a Rathalos from Monster Hunter as Big Boss, which is very cool. Anyways, he says, what franchise would you like to see get Kojima-fied? But, okay, so what does this mean? What does it mean for a franchise Made to be kojima good? Just so we know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is a good question. If you know, Have like the next entry directed by Kojima, I think, would be the easy so I think, Okay. A kind of, and maybe another example would be Castlevania Lords of Shadow. Where he was like, ah. he got heavily involved in that. And the thing that I think, and I don't know about this for sure, but I think the thing that he added to it was its uh, kind of like crazy ending. I don't know. I think that's just an easy case of what's the most interesting part about that game, the ending. Let's give it to the biggest name on the game. Well, I still, there's something about that game like that I can't put my finger on that I really love that first Lords of Shadow. Like really? I adore that game and the second one and the DS games kind of were not as good. And I, I don't know if that just meant that he was sort of like overseeing just a lot of elements of the story or what, or maybe he was that big twist was kind of like just his thing that he wanted to see in it. But like, I don't know. It's like a, I always, that's kind of what I think of a kojima thing. It's just like, mm. like making the story more interesting. Well, I, I wonder, don't know. This is maybe a, a business cynic, a cynical look at it, but maybe having Kojima on as a producer just meant that team would get a little more money, a little more time, a little yeah. more of an effort from Konami, you know, and maybe that's all they needed to create a higher product, higher quality product. Yeah. And then there was all those talk, uh, like discussions about like how Kojima was going to produce a Contra game and whatnot with those guys, right? Yeah. Isn't that a rumor? I always wonder if that turned into what their game that they released recently, uh, Rage oh, of the Broken Planet. I don't know if yeah, legally know. that's allowable. Um, so, but yeah. the, the answer is uh, WarioWare. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to see uh, Zelda. Kojima's Zelda? Kojima's Zelda. What yeah. would that look like? It would be Zelda Kojima fied, which is been stated. a lot more melodramatic. You just said, you know, directed by Kojima. That's what it would be. I know, but what, like, what are you excited about with that combination? I think it'd be crazy, right? Specific as ever. Yeah. <laughs> you could do a, a story mode for Dota 2 directed by Kojima just to see what that would be like. Surreal. Now this is a good idea. Dan Tack, why can't you be more like Big Brother Surreal? <laughs> I don't know. That's such a cool idea. I, I almost see it as like maybe like just to kind of make up our own whatever this is. It's like you take the story... Like Metal Gear was just like a like a NES game with no story, and then Metal Gear Solid became this wow. melodramatic. I mean, it had story, right. but like this very taken very seriously, like melodramatic. A lot of emphasis on uh, cinematics and stuff like that. Like I would like to see that sort of applied to like my favorite childhood franchises, like Mega Man X. I would love to see like oh, okay. like a crazy like really <laughs> yeah. We pay a lot of attention to the story, make it really melodramatic and dark and realistic and modern, like. So that's something that I would like to see. Yeah, you know? yeah, of course. Maybe that's what that means to Kojimaify something is it's taken more want, seriously. Like, you just want like a Mega Man X anime at this point, right? That I mean, that kind of exists within really? Mega Man Maverick Hunter for the PSP. They made like animated cutscenes and stuff oh, like that. Oh, interesting. So, cool. and I feel like Mega Man X Five was basically like, what if Kideo Kojima yeah. made made oh, a yeah. Mega Man X? Four, five, and six all had animated cutscenes too. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So huh. you're right, Serial. It's already been done. What they were also extremely up their own asses, which is, which <laughs> yeah, is very yeah. much like Kojima. <laughs> Tim Ferrara from Arizona. 
He says God's country. I don't agree with this. Uh, Chick Fair from Arizona. This is very God's specific country. about which places he There is a God's logic. Country. There is a logic. He says, with the release of Pokemon Go, I thought it was inevitable to get the overflow of licensed tie-in games using augmented reality in a similar way. While the App Store does have plenty of generic titles, there's not a lot of big names taking advantage of this. Do you feel like this is a missed opportunity? What licenses would you like to see jump to AR like Go? This guy's acting like Garfield didn't come out. I know, right? Oh, Go. that's right! It's lead competitor, <laughs> obviously. Well, what, what happened with that Harry Potter thing? It's still coming. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, they beta invites are probably going, you know, oh, really? signed up for the beta or whatever, but yeah. And, and was that the same developers as Pokemon Go? Yeah, it's Niantic. Okay, yeah. and in theory it'll be the Fantastic Beats you're tracking down? That's what I would think, yeah. Or maybe it's just every letter from every word that's ever been in a Harry Potter book. Mm -hmm. I think most companies are just looking at an angle to to approach it uh, from so it doesn't be Pokemon Go, right? Yeah. But, but uh, it, yeah, they're, I'm sure it's being looked in. There's that Ghostbusters one. That's right? exactly it. If you check out GameFormer.com, over the week they announced uh, a Ghostbusters AR game, which the trailer, you know, believe it or not, it's like a phone ringing and then people putting on a pack or whatever <laughs> it's like it doesn't show anything about that oh you mean ghostbusters. ghostbusters but it's just like okay ghostbusters is a license wants to get into this and i'm so fucking stupid i was watching that trailer and i was like okay here we go obvious cash in here we go and then it got to the part where like the trap is being wheeled out and the trap opens up you got to slide your phone on the ground well i don't know but i just remember like in terms of like tech that i fell in love with as a kid the trap specifically, oh, I have yeah. such a soft spot for. My brother, like within the last couple of years, found one of those toy traps at like a toy store and bought it because him and I just have such fondness for that toy. As really? Children. And yeah. he turned it into a real one. <laughs> and the real weird part, he tried crawling into it and he's stuck in there now. <laughs> oh, oh I, should, I, should I feel like call. I'm surprised that, you know, there aren't any sort of ones that use sort of Pokemon Snap elements of just like, yeah. hey, go around and take a photo of this thing and mm. sort of make the monster super rare, but say, hey, I have proof that I saw, you know, this one monster because I took a photo of it near yeah. my grandma's house or whatever. I got good news for you, sir. You're playing that game right now with just your <sighs> camera, the, 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 your uh, camera on your phone. Uh huh. And so I'll give you <laughs> big points if you can get okay. a picture of Kyle being goofy. All right. That's going to be hard to I'll get. I'm very serious. That's true. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Uh, Riley from Issaquah, <laughs> Washington writes in and says, Hello, G.I. Show. With superhero movies ruling the movie box office these days... <clears throat> I don't know why movie box office <laughs> makes me laugh. <laughs> I have to rise to... That's most of the video game box office. Uh, look, there's so many boxes. Isn't that right, Dan Tech? <laughs> box, box, boy. The box, Bing. box, boy, box office. Um, he says, I'm surprised we don't see more superhero video games. I'm a big fan of superhero games and... This is interesting. Riley here was disappointed when Sucker Punch announced Ghost of Tsushima instead of a new Infamous game. Uh, yeah, you'd think they'd want to cash in on the superhero boom that is going on right now. I feel like 2014 it was still going on when I Second mean, Son came out. Anyways, enough uh, critiquing this email. Riley says, the studio isn't too far from where I live, so maybe I should go protest. Don't do that. They're very nice people. Um, he says, anyways, my question for the panel is, what would be your ideal superhero game or what superhero would you like to see receive a video game? Personally, I'd love to see a first-person shooter based on The Punisher. I wonder, I'm curious if you played the Punisher game that Volition made, which is kind of fun. I would be curious to see what sort of hook a Punisher first-person shooter would have to make it stand out. Yeah. I'm just not sure, like, what what specifically does the Punisher do besides just kill a lot of people that ma that would make for an interesting video game? That's basically yeah. just... Um, he wears a trench coat. He does wear a trench coat. That's true. Uh, Riley also says, P.S. Joking about protesting Sucker Punch Studios. Oh, I'm sorry. I was too. P.P.S. Still waiting for that Game of Informer cover about Rocksteady's new Superman game. <laughs> Any day now. <laughs> Any day. I would uh, like to see a game about a flying superhero. That would be fun. It doesn't yeah. even have to hmm. be Superman necessarily, but I just I feel like I haven't really ever flown yeah. in a fun way. In a I'd like. Well, yeah, I'd game. like to see Rocksteady make a Superman game. That'd be interesting. Would you really? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of being well, so not, I'm not gonna like dismiss the idea, but it's like I'm not particularly excited about it. But. I uh, yeah. I just rewatched the ending to Arkham Knight again, and not to spoil anything, but it reminds me of that Punisher game he pitches. It's it's just so wild. Um, the series is good, turns out. It turns out it's very good. I would like to see Animal Man, mm. classic DC character. What who can do? Change he absorbs like animals? powers an animal. from animals. It's a little anamorph but he doesn't change into the animals, I don't believe. He's just like, now I can fly like a dumb bird, and now <laughs> I have the strength of a gorilla. <laughs> dumb bird. Yeah. Okay. So he's not Beast Boy. He's, he just yeah. adopts. Okay. He just in a very boring visual way, absorbs, I think, animal powers. You could do a, like a weird puzzle game based around Purple Man, just his, his ability to convince people. Ooh. And just have like, okay, you need to solve this puzzle by convincing the right person to do like, you know, flip an alarm or whatever, and then you can get by, something like that. I have good news for you, Surreal. Oh, yeah? Maybe that game's available right now in your 
phone's camera. <laughs> Anyways, Max Strauss says, hey, GI fellas. Uh, Max from Rochester here. Uh, Rochester, New York, mind you. I've got a scenario for you. Ready for this? This is okay. a tricky one. A right. scenario. He says, Smash 4 Deluxe has been announced for the Switch. Should I forward this to Imran? Should we read up this news story? Yeah, we yeah. should get that up on the okay. site. He says, the trailer plays and it has everything you would expect. Some new stages, maybe an inkling or arms character. And then the trailer seems like it's over. Suddenly, shlink, new challenger approaching appears on the screen and some epic familiar music starts to play. This mystery character steps into frame and the camera zooms out to reveal that it is blank. The internet goes crazy. People are running through the streets because they're so excited. The trailer instantly gathers millions of views because of this super hype character. My question is, what character could they reveal for Smash that would gather the most hype, period? He says, I personally think someone like Goku would get this reaction. I don't know yeah. if people would flip over cars in the streets because of Goku. I, I think it would be the <laughs> one that would be mo most probably the biggest. Here, yeah. Okay, so we need to set up some ground rules because this is a fun question. Can we choose... Kaz Harai. You know, like, does it need to be reasonable? See, I, I think you could, but I don't know that Kaz Harai would, like, make people any crazy. So it can Goku. be any character, whether or not they've ever appeared on a Nintendo console. Just I, character in Smash. Yeah, I think so. Just for the yeah. it can for be any be character. Fun. Does a character yeah. have to exist in a video game, or can it be any character? No, I think any character. So, that, so it's like, oh, you could say Abraham Lincoln, but they literally already did that trailer with the Mii support right. for yeah. Smash 4. Right. So what character? Is Goku number one? I think, I think, I think Goku's... I think Goku's Just because one. of the like long-term, everyone's demanding it for so long, you know? Yeah. But like, I, would, I think something like Batman would be interesting. You know? Oh, be like surprising. Arkham specifically? Yeah. Or it doesn't have to be. It could be like just any Batman. It could be like a custom sort of... It has its own specific look for Smash Brothers, you know? Batman over Goku. I think the, the, the only other thing that would I think would be really crazy would just be just, just something that would be... It, that would indicate that it was some sort of cross platform of the earth, just like here's Master Chief, like yeah, like maybe you know whether or not that would game would end up on Xbox. Just the idea of something from another platform holder. What about would Master Chief get more or less of a reaction than if they had the official trailer? It's like the grand debut, shlink, grand tease, and then it's just Osama bin Laden. <laughs> Very current reference. <laughs> Quite very uh, confusing. His little logo, very like, controversial. Just, says for, just for whatever reason, it's <laughs> just comment. ISIS. That's that's his logo behind him. Every comment is, uh, is just ellipses. Just every <laughs> single one. Like what? Dan, who is the number one character to get a it's reaction? Hard to say, like when it was restricted to video game characters, I was going to go with like the Lich King or Thrall or Gordon Freeman. All right. Oh, Gordon Freeman. Gordon Freeman. That'd be cool. Good. But uh, why not? They're licensed out to Final Fantasy at this point. Yeah, yeah. But then when we when we opened it up to the whole world, um, man, that's just I don't I don't know. Like Barack Obama, maybe. <sighs> that's so close to. I, I don't. I, I just don't think those that, would be as exciting. Right. I think yeah. Goku would still beat all of them in terms of hype, right? So what if they did but, like Gohan? Like they're just like one step <laughs> over. <laughs> Go ten, everybody! <laughs> Akira Toriyama. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> what about if it's like they announce it and just play it completely straight, but it's just like concepts, right? So it's like the Andes Mountains, <laughs> right? What, what if you're all really hyped I, for the I, Andes? I do Mountains? not think that would get people as excited. Pornhub. Uh, I think. I think. I, don't think so. I I wonder about the Master Chief idea because I think of any franchise that like Microsoft might be like. Yeah, yeah. I we mean, we need some hype for this that, franchise. That will do right. more for us. I mean, yeah, we won't have Smash Brothers on Xbox, but he, oh. people would be excited about Master Chief and Smash Brothers. I got or, it. You know? I got something more likely than okay. that. And I would put this at Dantac, hand the god. I put it at twenty five percent chance happening. That's pretty high. If they announce this. Smash for the Switch, which what percentage are we putting that at? Seventy five. Yeah. Ninety. I think it's a Wii U port. with yeah. New stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dude, Steve for Minecraft. Oh. Yeah, that's good. I, I think that would get. I think that would s make it sell better. I don't know that the internet would go crazy for yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not exact. Yeah, definitely. Like people would know it, but I don't think they'd flip over cars. No, the, the famous PUBG guy. I but I almost I, don't know I, see, it, would be I see it as like I, I don't I don't see it as like people losing their mind, but I see it more as like a, that feels pretty likely. You know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah. I would almost say higher than twenty five percent. It's very like fun. A good twenty seven, twenty eight percent. Kyle has it on good authority. It's gonna happen. <laughs> you you think that your user? It's like okay, smash on Switch, yada yada yada. But like I just saw Game Explain, those geniuses over there on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, they post like what we want from Smash on Switch, and one of them is just like a new Donk City level. It's like oh, of course that would happen, but that just makes me so excited yeah. <laughs> for new Smash content. There's I, so much good potential. I want there. Snake back in there. I would love to just just have that. Just he returns. You know. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's going to be. 
Good luck for Metal Gear Survive <laughs> as the character. The show. Lord of Dust. <laughs> oh, maybe they could have, uh, what's his name from uh, Death Stranding, the lead guy. <laughs> maybe he can be in there. Babies? Yes, Guillermo del Babies, Toro. the actor from Walking Dead. Babies. <laughs> Do you th oh, here's an offbeat <laughs> question. Do you guys think Hideo Kojima is going to put himself in Death Stranding? Yeah. That's a great question. I bet he yes. he's going to be wearing a yeah. mask. But yes. He's He'll probably be wearing a mask? Him. Yeah, he was, probably, he was the guy in the trailer who was... Making finger that, guns. Well, oh, that, he's I, the baby. I think the speculation. Does anyone is know that, what he looks like as a baby? Yes, that's true. I was a Kojima was, baby picture. <laughs> I was going through my notes the other day of, for Metal Gear Solid Five because I took like pages and pages and pages of notes, and it's really fun to read through because like I don't remember any of that stuff. But uh, I forgot just the funny detail of the fact that uh, Miller's wearing glasses. I forget if it's Ocelot or Miller. Miller's wearing glasses in Metal Gear Solid Five that when you zoom in on them, it just says Metal Gear Solid Five: The Phantom Pain. It's so stupid. <laughs> So I think Miller's glasses are probably number one yeah. for Smash 4. There we go. A um, Daytona car. <laughs> Dear Ben and GI Crew, first of all, I want to weigh in on the Scorpion incident from last week. Uh, Was this the uh, same guy? Or no. a different person? Different oh, person. Okay. I hope to God it's a different person. He says, I'm from Texas too, and while I've never found a Scorpion, when I was younger, I would find lizard corpses in my ceiling fan light bowl at least mm. three to four times a year. Wow. <laughs> Lizard. I think your parents are putting them there. It's like a twisted tooth fairy. I would see a lot of lizard corpses in South Carolina. Really? Yeah. In light bulbs? I don't know if I saw them in light bulbs, but outside I would see a lot of them. Really? Yeah. Wow. Are you one? Uh, what's, what was the question? Anywho, Alex has a question saying, I have an actual question. Uh, with the announcement of yet another Star Wars trilogy being developed, they didn't say trilogy, they said series. Um, from the uh, Game of Thrones creators. Oh, okay. okay. He says Ryan Johnson's is a trilogy. In addition to the current trilogy Ryan Johnson's directing, okay. the Han Solo movie, the rumored Obi-Wan movie, are we officially being oversaturated with Star Wars content? It seems like Disney wants to turn Star Wars into an analyzed, annualized franchise. And even if they mix it up by moving around to different parts of the galaxy from year to year, do you think the public will get burned out? Thanks, Alex. I think uh, the public won't get burned out for a while. Give it another ten years. Like it, there, there's definitely going to be an an oversaturation. Like just tons and tons of Star Wars. But Has Marvel been oversaturated? There are multiple films a year, and I think it's yes. the lesson of like if that quality bar is high, people will withstand a hell of a lot. I think, like I said, it's going to take a while. But I, the, the, they're not uh, they're not wasting any time. You know, lining up movies, lining up. There's going to be so more so much Star Wars. Okay, it's like you know that Spaceballs. It's baseball scene, you know? Star Wars, the flamethrower, Star Wars, X, you know, X, Y. Right. You know the scene I'm talking about. It's Are you dreading scene. it? Uh, as a, you know, you know, I could be like the purist and be like, yeah, Star Wars is like, this isn't the, this isn't the thing. But, you know, after we had the prequels, you know, whatever. You know, We're whatever. going places with it. Yeah. We're going places with it now and nothing can stop it. I think, you know, the fact that Marvel's been able to sustain this, it's like you can use that as an easy roadmap for Star Wars. But I still think... Kevin Feige and whoever's running the show over there at Marvel does not get enough credit. I think it's the craziest thing to happen in film history. They did what they're at like what 19 films in a row of being like solid quality, nothing shattering, nothing falling apart. It's crazy. Yeah. Maybe There's... Infinity War will suck, but I highly doubt it. It could. I mean, Avengers 2 wasn't great, but Yeah, but still. But I think that awful. movie gets too much crap. Yeah. Isn't, isn't Avengers isn't Infinity War going to be like 3 or 4 hours long or something? Uh, I don't know about that. It's going to be two long. movies, you know. Oh, is it? I'm still curious, like, what the movies look like between Aveng uh, Avengers Affinity War Part 1 and Part 2. They just cut right right between. It, there's no credits. It just ends. <laughs> is that what it is? It's midline. Someone's speaking, and they just cut out. That's it's good. Like, That's good part question. 2. Uh, Steven from Culver City, California says, Hello, crew. Um, he had a story about spiders hatching out from his fan life oh, while good. he was playing Lord of the Rings oh, online good. Mm. and oh, strings geez. covering his body. Mm, I love it. It's like that Into the Breach enemy. Um, he says, mm. unrelated to the story, I have a question though. Do any of you have any favorite convention or developer to visit just because of the food you get to have at a restaurant <laughs> when you go while you're in town? <laughs> if your answer involves Japan, that's too obvious. That really How about you don't cheat and give a runner-up? China. <laughs> <laughs> Love Chinese food. We've never been. <laughs> Known runner of country, China. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one I immediately thought of uh, is every time, like I've been to Montreal 60,000 times, I believe, for cover story trips and stuff. There's a lot of game development going on out there. But uh, every time I'm excited just for the idea of eating some poutine. Yeah. Uh, just the best. 
Just the best, you guys. I keep trying to check. I will literally, whenever I go on a trip, I'm like, is there a Zaxby's in this area? Zaxby's? <laughs> yeah, it's like this fast food restaurant that I really miss from the south. Did they serve dead lizards? Uh, I think you could ask for it. It was like off menu. Uh, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no one, no one, no developer I've gone to has had a Zaxby's nearby yet. So <laughs> fingers is. crossed I'll get Zaxby's again. One of first these developer I go to to get to have a Zaxby's, 10 out of 10. <laughs> <again>. <laughs> That's not true, Sterling. You know it, dude. I know. I I haven't had a chance to visit as many developers as, as some of you guys have, but I I will say that one of the reasons I I am looking forward to E3 is to going to the Donut King if we go at the, oh, yeah. stay in that same hotel. That's Ooh. a good place. It's a good donut. It's a great donut place. Oh, Donut King's a tiny place. I was thinking about that bum f donut place you made us drive all the way out to so you could take oh, a no, picture. Oh no, that's not, not 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 the Danny Trejo. Danny donut. Trejo's donut. Yeah, holes. we didn't get no. to try them though because no, the line was so long. Line was so long. So yeah. I had to go to the airport. It's a solid donut place next to our typical yeah. hotel. Is yeah. it too much to ask? Nicholas Run by Lai. good people who were very nervous about us giving them a, an, an award <laughs> jokingly. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. Nicholas Lai writes in and says, hello, Game Informer Show. During last week's episode, you lamented the fact that not a lot of people write in asking you about your opinions on different news pieces and stuff. Uh, he says, I actually listened to a podcast for reference, it's the NPR Politics Podcast. Sorry, I listen to that one. Yeah, I do. Um, he says, where they have a segment called Can't Let It Go, where each person brings up a story at the end of the episode that they can't stop thinking about. Relevant Relevance to the podcast be damned. You must <laughs> need to think up a silly name for it, uh, but you've got an easy recurring segment there. Maybe call it Reinformer. As long as it has a pun name, I'd be pleased. I've thought about that because I love that segment too where it's like, hey, here's this new story and I haven't been what's able to it, talk about it yet. What's it called again? Can't Let It Go. Can we just call the segment NPR Politics is Can't Let It Go? <laughs> <laughs> can't Let It Go, Koo. There we go. <laughs> it writes itself. Game yeah, Informer it really side does. quest. Uh, I love that idea. Uh, I worry about padding out the length of the show. We sure. need to leave time for lizard jokes. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll figure it out. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, Billy from Gloucester, Virginia, friend of the show, writes in all the time. He's wonderful. He says, uh, I've heard you talk about the old CG Donkey Kong Country cartoon on the podcast before. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched it as a teenager because I loved the games. I'm sure it was just as good. Oh, he says, it's not great, but I didn't hate it. All right. Okay. Uh, I've actually used a song from the show as my alarm to wake me up for, it has to be close to a decade now. <laughs> That's awesome. Why has he been using it? It's the only alarm that he's never slept through. This is the song that he uses as an alarm clock from Donkey Kong Country. Oh, wow. Sit back. We're absorbing this full thing, Dan Tag. All right. Here we go. Well, that's the last of them. And nothing. Not one clue how to break the spell. And if DK never wakes up, well, he can't very well protect the crystal coconut in his dreams. Don't worry, Cranky. He'll wake up if he knows what's good for him. Wake up! I call BS on this email. This has to be the longest alarm. This would be miserable. I call BS. Nobody wakes up to this. Really? Are you really? kidding me? This would absolutely wake you if up. If you put this on the other end of the room, you would have to get up in order to turn it off. I think that was like a... Oh, it was a whistle. He says, my wife, who has lived with me, using that as my alarm for the last decade, is obviously the best woman in the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, she has absolutely the right to walk out at any point. Buy her some ear, uh, some sound-canceling earphones for her yeah, birthday. Yeah, buy her some TV show-canceling earphones. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> what? Wayne, we have talked about Donkey Kong Country music for like the past two weeks. But not we? the good Donkey Kong Country music. <laughs> I know. Which is clearly the amazing series soundtrack. renowned for its amazing soundtrack. And, and we're, we're talking about the like, worst you, possible. You're talking about the show soundtrack, right? <laughs> <laughs> the bottom of the barrel. Excuse the pun. Um, Blaine, out, uh, Blaine Erickson says, Dear Ben and the Jets. Cute. Um, so I just replayed through Dead Space 2 and 3 recently. Dead Space 2 is easily my favorite horror game of all time and one of my favorite games in general. With the recent shutdown of Volition, I think he means visceral. visceral yeah, yeah, the chances of a Dead Space 4 in the near future have probably dropped significantly. So my question to you is, if they were to make a Dead Space 4, what would you want to see from the game? Would you want it to go back to its horror roots? Would you want a new story characters? Please, dis please discuss. Please, for the love of God, discuss. Shout out to my main boy, Ian Miller. Cool. Yeah, what's uh, up, Ian? Hey, Ian. Um, I, I definitely would like to go back to the horror, to the more horror style thing instead yeah. of the focus on combat and stuff like that. I, I like 3. Like, uh, 3 gets a bad rap, but I really would want a Dead Space 4 to go back in space. I don't want to make my own weapons. 
More um, microtransactions. More microtransactions. <laughs> That's what we always I, wanted. I was actually playing Dead Space 2 uh, this weekend. Cause, uh, really? Not to... I, I really adore that game. Like, because we're we've been thinking a lot about our personal top ten favorite games of all time. Why? This because I don't know, you just, know, had, just kind of you just had about a it. discussion. <laughs> and about uh, it. and I was trying to think if maybe that would go on mine. And man, that game holds up. I really space, love that game. That's space two over one. Yeah. Oh yeah. By okay. by a long shot, honestly. Okay. Uh, so, but yeah, I would want to go back to space. It didn't have to be Isaac. I think Isaac's story concluded pretty yeah. easily. But I I did like that he wasn't a soldier. There was DLC where he plays a soldier in Dead Space Two. Or like a security guard or something. I don't yeah. quite remember. But I, I, I did like the sort of half life style. Like this guy's just trying to figure out what's going on yeah. and doing what he can. He didn't even li- like have weapons technically. He was just using like his tools to fight the the enemies and stuff like that. Well, if they made one and they won't for a long time. Yeah. Um, but if they made one and they tried to position it as like getting back to the horror, I feel like Gears of War Four did that in the marketing and the cover story trip a fair amount of like we're going back to suspense. I was just looking. It's on the cover of Game Informer. Like. Gears of War goes back to its suspenseful roots. I think if you talk to anybody that played Gears of War 4, I don't think anyone was like, this holy so cow. I sh- my pants. <laughs> yeah. That's my issue is that. Gears of War, even though it was like in a dark world, it was never scary. I feel like that say? that, that first one tried to be very, like, yeah. especially in the middle act, it tried to be very horror like thing. The underground yeah. stuff. Yeah, but, you, but like yeah. The, the problem was that you have this incredible gun that could pretty much kill anything that was going <laughs> to come at you. So it's not it. like, yeah. 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 But yeah, Dead Space, I just love just stuff going wrong in space and just trying to pivot and, like, figure out what to do. Like, there's so yeah. many sequences, like, where in Dead Space 2, you have to, like, fly between ships. That was just so awesome. Just, like, that idea of, like, I gotta I gotta figure this out. You know, I gotta get to safety. And Because and, like, it's so quiet out there is the cool part. I, I guess, yeah. And then I, at 3, I mean, I, at 3 just never clicked with that. I always felt too safe just being on the ground in the snow in a weird way. Yeah. Like, because, like, like, doors would literally open in Dead Space. Where, with the potential of you getting sucked out into space, and you had to figure out what to do quickly, you know. Yeah. So I would, I would really love to see Dead Space Four someday. It's probably my favorite EA game. Well, I mean, the uh, creators of Dead Space, the creative directors and whatnot, uh, who went on to found Sledgehammer Games, they're now working at Activision proper, maybe on some new IP. Maybe the new IP is just Dead Space. Who can say? It's a wacky world, right, Dan Tech? It is. Crazier things have happened. Yeah, that's not true. That's an EA property. So <laughs> uh, Crazier court- things have happened. Yeah, it's true. Oh, i put the Dead Space guy in Smash Brothers. Oh, people would lose their you minds. Know, I, I honestly thought of that, but I think he was in PlayStation All-Stars, so I didn't bring it up. Oh, was he really? I think Isaac was in there. I could be wrong about that. And no. plus, you'd have to use is the one character from Extraction on the Wii? Is that what the Wii version was called? <laughs> sure. <laughs> You're like like solving puzzles with the Wii. We're talking about two here, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Corey Davies writes in and says, Hello, my name is Corey Davies, and I'm from Big Lake, Minnesota. Oh, uh, Here's my lone challenge, because I'm a loser. Uh, that's You're not, not loser. true, Corey. We love Come you, Corey. from Minnesota. Big Lake at that. Uh, anyways, here's my question. As the Dark Souls remastered release looms in the distance, I went back and watched the Super Replay with the late, great Tim Turry. He's alive and well. And I was watching all 30 episodes, and I got the feeling that Dan Tack does not like you, Ben. <laughs> what is, what is, <laughs> this question comes up a lot. What is up with that? Your episodes were hands down the funniest, making Dan so uncomfortable. It was a masterpiece. So I guess my real question is, would it would be, is it a show or is Dantec really just that quirky? I guess only you can answer that, right? He's asking, am I quirky? I'm, I'm confused here. Serial, to what extent is Dantec putting on a show when he records videos for stuff like Dark Souls where he pretends to be flustered by I us? have still not figured it out. Uh, Kyle, do you there's, know what's going on with Dantec? There's no way of knowing. Uh, Leo in the booth, have you figured out Dantec? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be damned. All right. Well, Leo, if you could write up an email and uh, send it out to the staff, that would be appreciated. Yeah. Sure thing. 30 hours, 30 <laughs> episodes of that thing. I remember, was it 30? Man. That's what he says. What, it what didn't you, feel like it. What are your memories of it, Dan? I don't remember it being 30 episodes. I think it was like 16. Whatever. What do you remember from replaying those It was games? a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun playing that with Tim. Yeah. I remember that. Just Tim, though. He didn't call you out. I noticed right. that. I was only on, like, the first six, I think. Yeah. We, were, we, were came, we were coming on the weekends for that one. We really Oh, wow. Oh, because it was before a, the yeah. Dark Souls 3 cover story That's trip, right. and it's like, we need to refresh ourselves on Dark Souls. What better way than to play it? And it's like, at that point, we should just record it. And so we came in early on a Saturday. We did. And then Dan Deck was grumpy and wanted to go watch esports or something. There was some tournament you wanted to watch I did want to do night. something. Yeah. Maybe we that's got, why. We had, we had Jimmy John's. <laughs> um, to be fair, I was pretty good. We yeah. played Dark Souls three as well. That was fun. We yeah. did do that. Yeah. Oh, geez, a lot of that stuff. Um, Kyle Miesbauer says, "Hello, crew. I uh, just wanted some Overwatch. I was just watching some Overwatch League highlights on Facebook, and I heard something that made me double take. Is Dan Tack an Overwatch League commentator? 
If so, how did that happen? I'd love to hear the story. I mean, we could start. We could start off by saying that no, I am not an Overwatch League commentator. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. But I think that's sort of the end of the whole. <laughs> Dan, this email, I was so confused. I actually Googled, like, is Dan Tech been doing a little, little freelance commentating on the set? I couldn't find any. I think like I might control for that. This is the, 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 <laughs> to, the degree to which you haven't figured out Dan Tech is that you weren't sure. <laughs> no! Was, that was, true. Is, no! Uh, was it, did somebody sound like Dan Tech? Is that what it was? Or I don't know. Was he was quite convinced Dan that Dan Tech was a commentator. I have not done any commentary okay. for him. Give us that commentary like. reel of what it'd be. Give us your little sample of. I haven't even right. tried. If you were like okay. commentating over a game that okay, was all about pretend someone's about to, you know, throw out their ultimate. Yeah. All right, somebody picked Hanzo. Game over. Peace out. Box boys. <laughs> all right. Well, Look at that. Uh, Overwatch League, if you're listening, that, uh, I, hire this that's man. That's what he heard. That's what he heard. All right, man. Hey, game informants. My name is Manton. Okay. And okay. I'm from Minneapolis. I think this Manton character called in a while ago. And the Manton told story about Leo eating. Oh, the apricots. apricot. Mm. Oh. Uh, Manton says. My iPod broke. Could you play the Big Bad Beetleborgs theme again? <laughs> I was watching this that is... on Netflix yesterday. Really? Yeah, because I wanted to hear the theme. I was like, I feel like I've heard this recently. And I, mm. and I just played the beginning. This is the show with the... So Jay instead of going goes? to YouTube, where most people go to find old themes, you, you, it you was fired on the it up? I was okay. on the screen. I was like, I, I remember this theme song being interesting. Oh, uh, okay. It wasn't. And but... it, no, I think it is. Uh, Leo, we can cut if we need to. Uh, how you doing on that? I could just sing it. Yeah, oh, take yes, it away. yeah. Three typical average kids inside a haunted mansion. Just so happens, free to ghosts, and now they're Beetleborgs. <laughs> Big <laughs> bad Beetleborgs. Big there you go, Manton. Uh, any other songs you want to request, just write in podcastgameformer.com. <laughs> Justin Brimley. <laughs> Says, hello, podcast crew. Today I had it officially confirmed to me, for me, that one of my new favorite things, Drop Mix, completely bombed in stores, at Aww. least locally. I'm attaching a couple of pictures to show you what I mean. He has a picture of Drop Mix on a clearance rack for 20 bucks. Oh. Is that, what does that retail at? 100. Should be 100. That, for 20, 25 bucks? Dude, buy Drop Mix. Surreal. It's awesome. For that low of a price. Yeah. Surreal. Will you, for the love of God, will you buy Drop Mix? <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, Hold on. Please, dude. Pull out my phone. I think it was on sale on Amazon recently as well. Mm. Here we go. <laughs> Get him on that mic. <laughs> oh, here's a tricky on one. Here's a tricky one. So this is Trent from Chicago who says, Go Cubs for Reiner. Hello. Um, he says, While playing Assassin's Creed Origins the other day, I lost a very frustrating fight to a troop of Roman legionnaires, and I was desynchron... <clears throat> I was desynchronized. Something that any fan of the series has become familiar with. Uh, apparently not saying it. Uh, it got me thinking about how other player death is dealt with in games. While often just a tiny part of the larger experience, Mortal Kombat notwithstanding, I appreciate the seemingly insignificant details that went uh, that go into making a character's demise impactful or unique. Uh, lacking a less grotesque way to ask this, what are some of your favorite or most memorable ways a game has treated your character dying or failing, getting a game over? Uh, two examples that readily come to mind were Mass Effect. I've never loved the simple yet intensely ominous and perfectly fitting synth soundtrack that plays whenever Shepard kicks the bucket, and the Arkham series with Joker's taunting. Uh, what do you guys like for like game over sounds? It is oh, interesting. I, I, or like you know, just okay. what happens on the screen. I always think of Uncharted, which is you know they try to be emotionally resonant with the storytelling, and then <laughs> every time I accidentally make the wrong jump and Nathan Drake falls off a waterfall, you just think like, what if this was actually story wise the canonical way that he died, and it's just Elena going Drake, you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's just it? just slowly yelling out, oh no, Drake. <laughs> That's a good Elena. <laughs> That's spot on Elena. That was uh, Sully. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Even better. Uh, Metal Gear. Just having people yeah. yell Snake is really iconic. Oh, I, no. Snake. I I think, hang on a step real quick. This is what makes me laugh a lot about Metal Gear Survive is because, yeah, Metal Gear Solid, one of the most iconic game over screens of all time with Otacon <laughs> yelling Snake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand where he's coming from Mass Effect 1 with the cool Saren's theme. Like the... Doo -doo -doo -doo. But Metal Gear Solid, absolute legend. First time I died in Metal Gear Survive, I was horrified by uh, what I found, which goes a little something like this. I read no vitals. Please respond. Please respond. To think it ends in such a way. How unfortunate. There we go! Metal Gear Survive, I, I everybody! Do, I do like the, uh, up until it was, after, up until the AI committed to you being dead, it was like, oh, that's unfortunate. I do like it being like, please respond. 
Please respond. Like if and it just did that forever, that, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah. What do you like though, Kyle? Uh, I like when uh, Leon gets beheaded in Resident Evil Four. That's a very uh, specific one. Yeah. Um, I like GTA where things slow down. You know. Oh, you do. Yeah. Busted. Wasted. Yeah. Wasted. I like that. Um, Sounds like yeah, Vantex last weekend. Hey. No I a problem. Though. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. I was mistaken. <laughs> Uh, uh, here's a here's a conundrum. Uh, Luke from Holland, Michigan, that is. He says, uh, "Hey, Damon and friends. I don't know what that's Damon. about. I don't know why he calls me Damon. Um, he, he says I've got two game ideas. What do you think of these? The first is a classic style adventure game set in the Bayou. S- say it together. Scooby Doo Scooby-Doo universe." universe. Overall, the aesthetic and the humor of the game would be in line with the old shows from the late 60s and 70s, not the new crappy shows. You'd have the option to choose between self-contained mysteries all over the world with the overarching meta-mystery going on, allowing the player to switch between characters who each have their own special abilities. There'd be multiple ways to complete the levels. There would be guest stars in the game, as is a staple of Scooby-Doo. I'm not sure what the Scooby Snacks would do. You need to figure that out before your first design meeting yeah, here, come on. Uh, Luke. Also, he says, second game, I don't have a firm grasp on, <laughs> but it would be a third-person open-world action game like Sleeping Dogs, but would take place in a futuristic city that is located in, in the Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, it would be, it sounds good. like he's got an idea. I don't it would be more I'm along listening. the lines of scummy Coruscant than typical dystopian setting. I, I Netflix needs to hire this guy for some of their upcoming yeah. content. <laughs> should play Netflix, re- you're great lit. Who is my should play Remember Me. <laughs> makes <laughs> you kind of think of that. Does that take place in the Grand Canyon? No, but it, oh. it kind of makes me think of it for some reason. <laughs> Like, I wouldn't be surprised if... I never beat that game, but yeah. if in the end it was revealed that you've been in the Grand Canyon the whole time. <laughs> I thought it was weird that the that, it, that game played such a big part in Pixar's Coco. <laughs> uh, so what do you think about the Scooby-Doo idea? I think that's a pretty solid idea. I, I do, do like I that I do idea. not like yeah. Scooby-Doo as a franchise. What? <laughs> when I, it was the first instance when I was a child where I realized that, like, animation could be bad. <laughs> <laughs> like I remember watching I love Batman and was, they had an episode like Batman was there and just one frame of Batman talking he just didn't have pants on you can look this up on YouTube yeah, and I remember my dad pointing that out to me and I was just like what the hell is this this is bad and uh, from that point on I never liked Scooby-Doo yeah I do like the idea of an adventure game mirroring that format like in a Cuphead style way of just the super crappy 60s 70s animation style yeah. and it is perfect for like swapping between characters and Maniac Mansion style yeah, it would I'm work. Into it. Yeah, Other I mean, than just I my personal distaste cool. for Scooby Doo, I think right. that's a solid idea. Here's the catch, though, Luke. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Got to hit the pavement. That's right. Crack open a book on coding. This takes work. There's no <laughs> idea. You got to make your own Scooby Doo. Yes. And cry when they get taken down. <laughs> or just beg <laughs> Nintendo or Namco, whoever's making it, to put Scooby Doo as the Smash Four character that would send the world. <laughs> yeah, that that would wow. do it. Just the abyss. Just a, a sound and the, you just hear that logo and you just. <laughs> And what if, but then the and reveal. Then, and then, like, hang on, Cyril, are you tongue. secretly an amazing impressionist? What's going on here? Does anybody have any impressions they can yell out for Cyril to do here? Uh, okay, no. uh, Crocodile Dundee. Take it away. I'm Crocodile Dundee. Come on, uh, you gotta try it. I've never watched Crocodile Dundee. Oh. Dan is mad I'm about this. Sorry. <laughs> it's Dan That's favorite not a film. knife. Yeah, come on, man. Uh, what I about. Bingo ate my baby? Is that one of the things he said? Sure. Uh, this, no, that's Seinfeld. <laughs> okay. That's not important. Do All Seinfeld. Right. Seinfeld. Not on Seinfeld. That's perfect. <laughs> I was just doing his impression. <laughs> I was not doing Ben's that. impression. It wasn't Ben's impression. impression of Seinfeld. That's very good. It wasn't an impression. Um, Brent in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, dead lizard town. He says, I've been meaning to write this to you for a while. I'm hoping you or perhaps another viewer can solve this mystery. Take a listen to these two musical themes. One is from a game called Comic Bakery on the Commodore 64. Oh. Of course. Uh, okay, so let's take a listen to this. It's pretty sweet. I like it. Hang on. Waiting for the signature sound. That bakery I want to go to. Hang on, though. Cosmic Bakery, if you ask me. This is a great, great song. Yeah. What, what did he do in this game? I looked at footage. You like, it's like a bizarre platformer, and then it just says, 
Oh, hang on. <laughs> oh, shit! What are you doing there? Playing, <laughs> playing a guitar? With, he's playing an electric with, ukulele. Playing the neck of a guitar with both your hands without yeah. strumming? Is that what I think he's holding a keyboard like upside down <laughs> and against his chest. It's so I can look at the keys better. <laughs> but overall, the gameplay it just had a huge text. I think it said Imagine Konami, like at the bottom of the screen throughout the gameplay. That sounds amazing. Yeah, this yeah. is what Konami needs to bring it back. It was their cover of Imagine by John Lennon. <laughs> Imagine oh, if there was oh. no Imagine Metal Gear. Do John Lennon. Do John Lennon. Oh, do John Lennon. Sing into this song, freestyle, and go. Uh, uh. I ain't got nothing but love in <laughs> eight days a week. I right, take it I all got. back. Yeah, uh, so, know. anyways, the point of this email <laughs> is he says, "All right, cool it, Comic Bakery." <laughs> he says, "Now listen to this song from Jurassic Park on the Game Boy." Oh my gosh. There it is. We were waiting for it. Brent from Raleigh, North Carolina says, They are the same song! They're yeah. the same song! They're very, well, well, very that close. That particular sound very similar to that. That, that part of it. Yeah, that right. part of it is the same. But that part is in the song, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he says, I read on a message board, <laughs> this is some hop and message boards, that perhaps the two composers worked with each other at a company called Ocean and that the Jurassic Park theme is supposed to be an homage to... Martin Galway's comic bakery theme, but it seems so weird to me. I didn't know if uh, this was just a really random place to honor a coworker, or this is some sort of plagiarism. What do you guys think? Uh, yeah, we don't know, but yeah, those are the same <laughs> yeah, signs. So. I'm not an expert in that kind of, you know, these but, are... Uh, maybe it's like a thematic homage, like Jurassic Park is the ultimate comic bakery in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they really, they, really makes you they think. cooked up some dinosaurs. They baked eggs. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. This makes a lot of sense. Ian Malcolm's comic. Um... Let's see. So, a lot of great Sorry, emails here. Did you say here. Ian Malcolm's a comic? <laughs> he's funny. He's funny in that first movie. Okay. He is funny in the first Lost movie. World. Uh, yeah. I like, he's funny in Lost World. I'm doing he's, my Seinfeld now. His yeah. yawn is funny in the beginning. Name one other joke other than mother, Mommy's Very Angry. I like when... Uh, what's that other... The other guy, the photographer. What's his name? The actor. Vince Vaughn. Vince Vaughn is yelling the full name of the woman oh, that they're searching true. for. Sarah. And, and he's like, there's no... there's." It would just shout Sarah. That's true. There's a lot of he's funny in that movie. Damn it, you're right. He's he is hilarious. one of the he is he is one of the saving graces of that film. Yeah. That's right. Saving graces of planet Earth. Um so here we go. Uh Garrett from Utah says, Dear crew, while listening to your podcast a few weeks back, I could not stop laughing at the thought of a game company having to earn their right to make their own IP by first proving themselves with someone else's IP. With this in mind, I've made a challenge for you to find out which studio would win what I call the Blue Point Games Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Studios were chosen at random by me, going down a list, and the game's IPs were also chosen somewhat at random, then they're all shuffled, going head to head and making a game based on the IP genre. Which studio do you think would make the better game and ultimately be able to be the Blue Point Games Challenge champion? All right, here we go. <clears throat> First official Blue Point wow. Games Challenge. He's got a whole bracket for it's this. It's really, it's, it's very specific. Oh God, the, right. the twist, I don't know if Blue Point is even on this. Um, okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've already done it. They've yeah, they've won. won. Okay. It's true. Okay, so, number one, which studio would make a better version of Pac-Man? Okay. 2K Games or Psionics? That's the Ooh. Rocket League developers. Ooh. Probably Psionics. Psionics, I think, because that's Psionics. more arcadey. I'm know? going with Psionics. Like Damn. a sports developer is a good pick for a Pac-Man game, but I think Psionics because it's more arcadey. I think so too. Yeah. Okay, number two. Uh, who would make a better L.A. Noir? <laughs> that game company or Firaxis? That game company. That game company. Wow. Really? I think I'd go Firaxis. I would go Firaxis. That Axis game company as well. doesn't even have real people in their games. Developers at that game company are talented people. Oh yeah, they though. absolutely are, but they're more point. like art focused. Where, where you can some weird abstract. abstract. You don't need to explain it. You just need to give an answer. Uh, I'm with Firaxis. Leo, can you break the tie? Firaxis for that game company. The second one. Yeah. yeah. And your faces. Oh no. All right, here we go. Uh, Bubsy, is it uh, Crytek or Harmonix? <laughs> Harmonix. <laughs> Crytek. Oh, man. Crytek. Because right. at least Crytek okay. would look very nice. Okay. All right, you guys. Uh, Wait, well, what, did, what was your vote, Hanson? Uh, I'll go with that. Uh, <laughs> number four, Sonic. No, it's what? Sonic. I'll go with Crytek. <laughs> okay, there we go. Sonic. That's what I wanted. Uh, do you want Bethesda's Sonic or Rovio's Sonic? Rovio's the... Bethesda's. I think Rovio, Rovio would do a better job. I think so, too. I'm going Rovio. 
I'm sorry, Sonic, Sonic 2006 right. like didn't work. You guys and can Bethesda be wrong. games don't really work. Yeah. And I feel like that overlap would create a that game. That would not that make a good game. Those two wrongs would not make a right, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. <laughs> Bomberman. You want Nether Realm or Rockstar? Rockstar. Nether Realm. I'm not in Nether Realm. For Bomberman? Yeah, the I said Mortal Kombat. Yeah. yeah, clearly go Rockstar. That's, that's what I said. What? Why? I'm overruling you guys. Why? Really? A weird, like, open world you can't Bomberman? Overrule them. I mean, I voted Rockstar too, but. All right, Leo, will you set up this Rockstar requires. Or, or, sorry, Bomberman requires very locked in specific good controls. Rocks, like, Grand Theft Auto games don't have great controls. I love those games, Rockstar. I adore them, but they the controlling. Is, is always like kind of an issue. Don't you just want to see Bomberman like roaming around an open world city just riding a jet ski? Didn't they try that what? with Axe Zero? I don't think there was a jet ski. <laughs> <laughs> I think we would get something right in. Let us know if there was a jet ski in Axe Zero. Yeah, All right, so Leo I, has to break the tie here, right? Nether Elmer Rockstar Leo, Bomberman. I don't want to waste either of those studios' time. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> point, this. too, actually. Actually, can I pick Leo's answer? Uh, Nether Realms. Okay. There we go. Oh, my goodness. All right. All right. There we go. Number six Bubble Bobble. Telltale or Riot? Riot. 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 All right. Sorry, Telltale. Uh, Final Fantasy game. Do you want Respawn making it or Supergiant? Supergiant. Supergiant. Super okay. All right. Uh, Duke Nukem. Do you want id Software or Insomniac? <laughs> id Software. Id, id Software. Okay. Well, some of these answers for me are like, like you guys said, I like I would rather Rockstar be doing something besides yeah, Modern I don't, don't want. They're locked I don't want anyone to make a Nukem game. In. What is the meaning to be a man? Uh, Ridge Racer, Dice or Mojang? Dice. 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 Wow. What, is, what has Mojang done besides port <laughs> Minecraft? They have a few other titles. They shut down yeah. scrolls that took a lot of effort. They uh, <laughs> did shut down scrolls. <laughs> SimCity, uh, Square Enix or Supercell? SimCity, Square Enix or Supercell? Square Enix. Uh, Supercell. Supercell. Help me out. Who's Supercell again? Uh, Clash, Clash? Clans. Okay. Yeah. So we're going Supercell for SimCity? So. I, I, went, I went with the other choice, mind yeah. you. I mean, it's great. Look at that Chrono Trigger part, man. Look, well, if the <laughs> idea is that they have to make this game good and for no, people to like it in order to make the their own game, I think they, the, if, if they're just doing this as, a, as a, basically as a stepping stone, they could probably just not. All we know is that they're making it. it. Right. Yeah. That's the only known. That's but true. but we also know the challenge is to make a game so that you can make your own game. Right, exactly. So, so who are you voting for? Supercell. Wow. Okay. Holy lord. Uh, uh, new Tony Hawk game. These are obvious. Mm. From Software or Avalanche Studios? <laughs> Avalanche. Av Avalanche. Avalanche. You don't want to see From Software? I would like to see both. <laughs> That's it. I, I wouldn't want you're, to see you're it. Ask, yeah, I want to see it, but it's... Come on. It's super like hard. You have Those to Tony do a corpse run to your <laughs> skateboard. Okay. All right. Uh, new Alien game. That old franchise. Sucker Punch or CD Projekt Red? CD Projekt Red. CD, CD Projekt Red. Red. All right. Sorry, Sucker Punch. I love Sucker Punch. Uh, yeah. Rampage. Oh, Based on the film. Uh, Fulbright? <laughs> <laughs> Fulbright? Okay. Or Polyphony Digital. Let's Gran Turismo it. people. Fulbright. Grant, Grant is now. <laughs> I the think Polyphony could do it. Because I could do a realistic, like... Those buildings would look immaculate. I want to know, right. know the stories behind those people that are living in that building. You could rummage through George's <laughs> closet. Just, you're, yeah, you're rummaging through this entire building, but you're a giant monster. Hang on, I'm changing my answer. Yep. I'm going Fulbright. I'm changing it to Fulbright officially. <laughs> uh, so I think it's just... Yeah, you got to rummage through that building. Uh, 14, uh, Shaq Fu from The Behemoth or Gearbox? Gearbox. Uh, I think behemoth. the behemoth would make a very funny Shaq Fu game. I think yeah. they would too. And I think it would look beautiful. It would look cool. Yeah. I'll Jack go. is already beautiful though. That's true. Tough to improve on that. All right. I'll go that. All right. We'll save the next round for next week maybe. All right. Blue okay. Point Games Challenge, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good so challenge. Much, Garrett I like from it, Utah yeah. for yeah. taking it so seriously. It we was interesting. It. It wasn't interesting. What do you guys like? Email of the week. That's it. Right Super there. Super Smash Bros. It's right there. It's either the just had it. Super Smash Bros. Nobody else has ever come up with like a, an activity. Well, right? I mean, we had I mean, we something had very them. close to this. They haven't been. Yeah. Th this one was cool. It was cool. Like, it was cool. I do appreciate the effort put into this. Just it's true, but Smash Brothers was an interesting idea. Right. It was an interesting. I don't idea. mind giving it to that. Either. I, I wouldn't mind giving it to flip floppers over here. Just cowards. I'm saying, I, right away. I, I, if, so, I'm so last, if I'm the last, if I'm the last one defending <laughs> the bracket, then I'll you know I'll concede. But okay. I, I think that's a much better. I think a lot more effort was put into that one than this. We'll give it to them next week. Okay, when we do the part two. What if we don't though? All right. So are you giving it to Smash Brothers? It's good. That's what you want. I like Smash Brothers. Okay. Leo in the booth? 
Smash Brothers and then give it to this one next week. All right, there we go. Right. Max right. Straws from Rochester, New York. But still, we encourage you to write in your emails next week to podcast at <laughs> Even, you, even though you'll lose, yeah. I guess. We're looking forward to hearing from you. All right, uh, that's it, everybody. Thank you so much. And thanks to Max for writing in with a great email. Everybody that wrote into podcast at we appreciate it. For now, stay tuned. Uh, we talked to Jordan Thomas about working with Matt and Trey on the South Park games, oh. working on Bioshock series oh. one, two, and three, working with oh. Ken Levine, his game The Magic oh. Circle. How much of that was a critique of Ken Levine, which did comes you just up for Bioshock Three? He did. <laughs> well, I have Bioshock Infinite. I guess, All right. So. <laughs> In the biz, we call it Bioshock Three. Um, and then the new game, The Blackout Club. So it's interesting oh. chat with a seasoned developer. So stay tuned for that. Jordan Thomas, welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's an honor to have you. If you're watching the video version, you are you should be very impressed by Jordan's backdrop. And if professional mic setup, this is a, a hell of a thing you got going on over there. <laughs> well, I, I stream a permadeath D&D show. <laughs> and so I invested, perhaps unwisely, in a little bit of equipment. Wow, what's the name of the show? It's called uh, Dice with Death. And uh, the first season uh, is has not all been released yet, but uh, is is complete. It was very bloody, uh, and the sort of basic premise is that any player whose character dies is actually off the show, and so death has a certain set of stakes to it, and uh, the players <laughs> take it very seriously. Is that bizarre? Like, do you look at the Twitch chat and the you know Twitch feed? Are people just constantly leaving comments like, "Talk about Bioshock 2. What do you think about Ken Levine? There was definitely a non-zero uh, Bioshock <laughs> factor when we first launched, but I, I think as time went on, you know, it's such an acquired taste that the people who stuck around are definitely there to watch Nerds Roll Dice. <laughs> well, hey, it's been fun watching you slowly tease the new project you guys have been working on on Twitter. It feels like it's always nice when you can feel anticipation, maybe dread, tension from developers coming through on Twitter in the ramp up to announcing their new game. So now you've officially announced, you know, the Blackout Club. Do you want to talk about like what it was like to keep this thing under wraps for so long? Uh, well, sure. And as I do, please let me know if this microphone is so sensitive that it picks up internal screaming. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's we've assembled a team of ex-Bioshock, Dishonored, uh, Thief, Deus Ex, even Prey uh, people who have uh, spent their years in AAA trying to sort of perfect interesting systems that the player can combine to kind of weave their own play style out of the ether. And so the idea of bringing that to a cooperative horror game in particular uh, has been intense and there's been a lot of soul searching involved but i think everybody on the team feels like it's a really interesting problem and and we've come out uh the other side ready to show people uh something that we're quite proud of yeah it, it's bizarre i mean with that kind of talent all funneling into it a game i mean how much pressure is there to just do the okay should we just make a game where we can work shock in some way cryptically into the title just to rope in that crowd i mean is there are there, there those discussions early on there were. Uh, in fact, this game uh, spent at least a few months as a more contiguous, um, not quite single player, because it was always cooperative from the beginning, but more contiguous, sort of trapped in the underground maze beneath this sort of suburban town. Um, uh, and it followed the formula in the, in the sense that it was a mystery where you sort of slowly uh, came closer to uh, the final sort of narrative beats and eventually you would come to an ending. Uh, what it has become is much more of a, almost a teens versus monsters simulator where you and your friends are investigating this, this sort of terrifying secret um, under the ground of, of your hometown, but the adventure goes on forever. The uh, design is procedural. And so, you know, uh, challenges and objectives will change night to night. And you don't really ever know what you're in for. And so why the change? Were you thinking more of, I don't know, Twitch streams in mind? Or what were the decisions behind that? That's a, honestly a very good question. Um, we, the biggest thing that that I think we felt that we were missing is time in the, the kids' neighborhood. Um, so you're mm -hmm. playing, you know, sort of... Uh, People and, and and from 13 to 16, give or take, you know that that sort of Stranger Things or or It Follows range uh, of age, and we the original design because we had to stay 100% contiguous, you were trapped underground for a lot of that time because otherwise the player will say, well, why don't I just go to the cops? Why don't I just wander <laughs> off? Yeah. And so we said, okay, no, let's let's build a little bit of of. Um, 
the sort of neighborhood above. And once we were leaping from rooftop to rooftop and recording the creepy stuff going on down in the street, we were like, this has to be the game. And so we broke it into missions that you can sort of dip into and that have their own kind of uh, boundaries. Uh, but there's never a question of do the kids go home because the answer is yes. Between missions, they do, and they go back to their hideout and they talk about what happened. And uh, you know, you get if you manage to record some interesting sort of creepy evidence, uh, you can review it back in the hideout, sort of uh, without annoying your fellow players. This th I'm trying to wrap my mind around what this game is, which is a good sign because it implies it's doing something new for the video game space. So. It's one long continuous story or it's just kind of an ambiguous world and you get more and more details the more you play, but there's no real end game in sight. It's just mission after mission after mission. It's sort of along the lines of Lovecraftian or cosmic horror where uh, like if you play Call of Cthulhu or any of that kind of ilk where the mystery is vast and you are just flashlights in the dark trying to catch a single contour and describe your experience based on that single detail. And so the shape of whatever it is that's lurking in that unknowable darkness is so huge that you're not going to defeat it. You're sort of always constantly looking for answers and trying to survive the night. So the missions essentially go on forever. Each night, um, you know, your objectives are very, very different. We want it to feel like you'll never, you never know what's around the corner. And the hope is that as you get closer and closer to the sort of um, secret heart uh, of the, the facility underneath the town, the sort of great maze that looks almost like the inside of a human ear, um, you, you'll get access to more of the thinking behind the antagonists with ever out, with ever, without ever actually unseating them. Forgive me. <laughs> That's, how do you incentivize players to keep at it? Is it just the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay and the loop is going to be so enticing that, like, yeah, you'll scratch the surface of the unknowable? How's that for a carrot? It's, uh, that's, that is a very fair question. Um, <laughs> I think that the, the sort of primary answer to that is that you are growing your character towards an eventual end. Your individual sort of profile is this sort of teenage investigator and you have different powers and abilities that you kind of slot in like cards in a deck. And as you make progress, as you record physical evidence in the world with your smartphone, you are gaining experience points uh, that are commensurate to the difficulty of that moment. So for example, if you had an objective tonight, which was record your friend being dragged away by the boogeyman, that is a highly risky thing to engineer. And so we're gonna reward you for that. And your character might gain an entire level from that single act. And so as you do that, you unlock further powers and eventually you will cap out that character. And I'm not gonna reveal what happens there, but suffice it to say that it's something that we are planning for. We, a, a sort of ascension. <laughs> Interesting, okay. I mean, just the idea of co-op horror I feel like companies have tried before, and it's always especially tricky. Also, randomly generated horror, procedural generated horror is difficult, and you're trying to tackle both in one game. Has it been a challenge? Do you want to talk about that process and kind of the do's and don'ts along the way? Oh, certainly, yeah. I mean, I would say that, you know, I want to be, I want to be candid. I, I think that relative to a game that, that lays claim to procedural content in the sense that the environment is randomized, that is not us. We come from the Bioshock school of thought. We like the game environment to have, make a very strong statement about who lives here, uh, what their day-to-day -day life was like, what their pain is. And so the neighborhood itself is a fixed location with, you know, and we know who lives in every house. And if you visit that house, you're going to see, uh, you might see a new email or something that is a detail of that person's life you didn't see the last time you visited. And what attacks you inside the house might be very different. But uh, the actual environment is something that means a lot to us. We want you to feel like a real hometown that you're visiting. You gain access to more and more of it as you play more of the game. And so as we expand uh, the our sort of base of content of the original map that we're going to ship with, um, you're going to potentially visit a school or um, go to uh, a secret facility, which is TV uh, to, to be announced, um, involved with a kind of conspiracy that is powering this, this town. Yeah. So overall, how's the development been so far? I would say it has been uh, dizzying, but in a good way. Um, you know, the, the I think everybody that we've spoken to about the game, uh, just friends and family, they all have a, a Goonies in their heart or a Stranger <laughs> Things or an It Follows or an It. You know, whether it's whether it's Stephen King or or even, you know, on, on the other end of the spectrum, like a Supernatural, that idea of 
people who deeply care about one another investigating uh, a sort of the sort of dark heart of their town, the, the kind of truth monster that, that uh, growing up eventually forces you to confront, uh, they all have responded to that instinctively. We haven't had to do much explaining of that core premise. And because that is true, we're very confident um, taking it to places you might not expect uh, because, because we believe that you'll be invested in just these kids and their bond. Okay. And hopefully your friends as well. Hopefully your friends as well. I mean, you know, we're going to have, it's a drop in drop out co-op arrangement. So people can join your mission uh, in progress and they can leave if needs be. And you may even be able to press your luck where if you, if you've completed one objective, you can, you can sort of fold and take home what you are rather um, uh, cash out and take home the experience you've got so far, or you can invest in, uh, uh, pushing your luck and going for another objective that same night. But if you do, every little crime you commit creates this sort of creepy music under the layer of uh, the concrete, the, the sort of the streets of your town. And that creepy music corresponds to your crimes and brings the boogeyman one step closer to attacking you. And so <laughs> there is an escalating risk uh, uh, the later you go, but the best loot, um, both sort of player customization and also tools, uh, are rewarded to players who are willing to to court uh, calamity. Okay, you, you mentioned the boogeyman a couple times. Now, how does this work? Is it just one nemesis-like figure, or is it just an enemy type? Or how do you define the boogeyman? I guess is my question. You don't is my the answer God. to that. Okay. Uh, Steven Spielberg famously said that if he had more money, he would have shown more of the shark, which, in my opinion, would have friggin' ruined it. So uh, the truth is that there is this, there is something out there which you can only see in game by squeezing your eyes shut and succumbing to your blackouts, the sort of eponymous blackouts that all the kids share. They all, they all have lost time, where they wake up at a crossroads in the middle of town, covered in dirt, and don't know what they've done. Well. If you close your eyes and and sort of you see this awful kind of um, theater of the mind, you can see this this white shadow coming at you, and you can only see it when you do that. That is uh, the boogeyman. It's not really the formal name for it, but uh, the kids don't know what else to call it, and uh, you you might find that it's right next to you when you do that. <laughs> Are you looking forward to, to modders just ripping the game apart and finding out that model and swapping it out for some wrestler at some point? Yeah, it'll just be a texture of me like tiling and flipping them off. <laughs> <laughs> What's I mean, is there a publisher for this game? Uh, there is a, a publishing partner. Um, at the moment, uh, it's sort of at their discretion whether they want to disclose who they are and their involvement. Um, we're sort of following up on that. But yes, um, we we do have some very gracious assistance this time around, and uh, we're very grateful for it. But at the moment, um, I think they're sort of deciding how they want to announce themselves. Okay, gotcha. And I mean, are you planning early access? It seems like a, a ripe game for that idea. I agree. Um, yes, uh, we haven't talked about an exact date uh, for that yet, but uh, there is something powerful about the unsafe feeling people have going into an early access game, and we would like to harvest that one way or another. <laughs> Unsafe on a technical level, horror level, just everything could be horrifying. Yes to all. All right. I mean, what about the studio these days? I mean, are you guys working remotely? Or are you in the studio right now for question? Or what does the actual studio look like? It's about half and half. Since the release of the Magic Circle, we have doubled in size from three to six, plus uh, a number of satellite contractors who have been just miracle workers for us. Um, we're still working with Patrick Balthrop, uh, uh, speaking of one of those contractors who does all the audio for the game and f from the teaser trailer that you might have seen. Um, and uh, we have David Pittman on, who did Eldritch, uh, and who was an indie, you know, a sort of indie guru before we even uh, broke away from AAA. Um, and so uh, we're now at six folks, three of whom are in-house and three of whom are remote. Okay. Is six uh, a sweet spot for you in game development? Do you feel like there's something magical in this arena? Honestly, yes. I, I you know, we might, we might expand someday to be... A terrifying 10, uh, uh, but I wouldn't want to go much larger than that because I know everyone's individual quirks and it's it's not entirely unlike being these sort of teen friends uh, together till the end. Like uh, it's it's it feels a little bit like that that same kind of band that you had of BFFs. And so who's the boogeyman in the game industry then? Ooh, dang good question. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll go with Janneman Nordhagen. 
<laughs> Who is that? He's, he's going to be uh, releasing his game at the sa- same day that we're announcing. And he's my nemesis now. <laughs> who is this we're guy? We're actually very good friends. He's, he's the guy who's doing Where the Water Tastes Like Wine. Oh, of course. Okay. Gotcha. What a yeah. weird deal. I mean, so uh, what was the release of Magic Circle like for you? I mean, you doubled in size, so it must have been successful on some fronts. What was the, that whole process like once actually you got it out the door? Yeah, the main thing it proved out was our ability to complete things. You know, the Magic Circle was not a financial success by any means. Uh, we survived and, you know, we, we did well enough that we're still here. But it was a sobering lesson about the changing shape of the indie game industry. Like, you know, if you're going to do a short narrative driven game, you better be very confident in its sort of mainstream appeal. And we were doing something frankly, for us. And uh, we learned a lot from that. And it was very cathartic and helped us sort of, frankly, stop brooding. You know, it was a comedy. It was, it was a very sort of meta, silly thing about uh, an unfinished game being finished by you from the inside. And we learned a lot and we now trust each other implicitly. And that is why we're taking so much of a risk here with the Blackout Club. I mean, to what level are you talking about stopping brooding? Is it just a matter of shifting environments for the type of game that you're making or literally like I just find myself complaining about the game industry so much I need to make a game to get that out of my system maybe it was a little of both I mean I shipped three Bioshocks prior to working on the Magic Circle and Bioshocks as much as I dearly love them have a reputation for being a little self-serious and so the Magic Circle was the other end of the spectrum where it, it sort of said okay the kimono is open. Look at how broken all of these uh, elements of the game and indeed the people making them can be. Uh, and it was an opportunity for us to sort of make fun of ourselves and our uh, big fat story. Are you happy with the way it was received? Do you feel like people, I mean, going back to one of the earliest questions, people just too easily were like, oh, this is a game about bashing Ken Levine. I think I get it. I, I did certainly hear that, and that's part of the reason why Ken did a voice for us in the game, is, you know, we're, we're on friendly terms, and he sort of graciously said, like, sure, I, I get the joke. Like, and so he, he was actually an HR guy <laughs> in a few audio logs. Uh, so, you know, that, that kind of knee-jerk, you know, we, we sort of laughed it off, because at the end of the day, we put nothing in that game that we ourselves were not guilty of, um, and that was that was a purposeful creative choice. Uh, but it, it did feel good to just sort of laugh at, at some of the, the tropes associated with, with video games and, and game development. <laughs> well, I understand it was, you know, cathartic and a way to move on from Bioshock. I mean, is it tough to break away from a series that big in your life? I'd imagine, I mean, we have people write into the podcast all the time that are colossal fans of Bioshock 2 and just say it doesn't get enough credit is it just a daily basis for you just people tweeting at you saying Bioshock 2 ruled it's the best one give it its due uh well I'll tell you that yes 10 years after it would have uh salvaged my (laughs) my fragile creative director ego (laughs) it's nice to hear Uh, I have I have heard uh, people become much more sympathetic to it um, years later. I think I think simply by virtue of the fact that it was made by a new studio in two years, it had a little bit of that um, sort of Bioshock 1.5 feel, and people at the time w- believed they wanted something entirely new. But I nearly broke myself for that game, and so uh, I'm proud of what we were able to accomplish in the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I read somewhere that you had very clear rules, like all right, you have to stay in Rapture. You have two years to ship this thing and it needs multiplayer. Is that uh, just the Rapture thing specifically? Is that just a matter of art assets and the production cycle? It was a combination, yes. Um, uh, Technology in part, uh, art assets, I was absolutely told we're going to need to reuse some art. um, uh, And the art done by the Irrational folks, uh, I was there for that game too, was so solid that it it was kind of... It was kind of a, a parameter that, that I chafed against a little bit. But on the other hand, I deeply loved Rapture. And, and uh, after doing Fort Frolic in the first game, I thought, okay, well, people liked the surreal elements. People liked the sort of nightmarish elements. What if I augment those? Um, that horror sort of DNA has always been there for me. And I've always worked on the most horrific element of uh, any of the games that I've been involved with. And, and so, honestly, with the Blackout Club, it's, it feels like coming home. Yeah. To vulnerable protagonists, to, to be able to say like, no, 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 you're not a, you're not a, a sort of uh, walking tank with with a magic hand and a gun hand and a, a head full of bad ideas. You're you're just a, a kid trying to survive. And uh, even though uh, the systems allow you to express yourself, you're kind of like having to take what would be 
the gun hand and the magic hand in a Bioshock game and become them. Like the, you have to combine yourself with your friends to achieve uh, the sort of desired effect. That, that's a bizarre concept, but yeah. I mean, so specifically the Lovecraftian horrors, which you're interested in. I mean, do you, it, does that just rule out jump scares? What level of fear are you trying to instill in players throughout the game? Uh, that is, man, I'm glad you asked that uh, because I wouldn't have come to it on my own. But but it rules out jump scares uh, almost entirely that we script in a manipulative fashion. We have designed systems um, which... If you'll, per, 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 if you'll permit me to go way back in time, sure. uh, we've designed systems that s are, sort of lean on uh, some of the stuff that I was doing back in Thief 3 uh, with a, a spooky asylum mission called the Shellbridge Cradle, where the hope was that jump scares would come out of natural systems interacting and player decisions. So uh, in the Blackout Club, for example, um, if you happen to close your eyes at the right time, you can see this sort of boogeyman shape right next to you and have a jump scare that, that was 100% uh, natural, a product of the sort of ecosystem. And our, our, our producer, Patches, uh, Michael Kelly, recently re was recording a playthrough video where he closed his eyes at exactly that moment. He had a syringe in his hand, which is ammunition for the sort of tranquilizer uh, crossbow. And the shape was right there and he just started screaming in front of the entire office and stabbing in space and of <laughs> course the thing pounced him but it was legendary and, and w like we had no specific engineering of that moment it wasn't a scripted scare at all is it more fun to design a co-op game just because playing it over and over again there's more variety do you feel like the team is still somewhat energized by playtesting this thing uh, always. And uh, they only become more so as we integrate more of the sort of procedural elements. Uh, our big goal is to surprise ourselves with the content, you know, so um, as long as the combination of the room that you're being asked to visit for an objective's sake, the twist on the objective and the challenges you met along the way kept us on our toes. We feel like it's it's got legs for the players who are willing to invest lots and lots of hours. Uh, and so Yes, um, the those moments are are what we live for these days, and and I hope to make patches scream many more times before we ship. <laughs> All right, so I'm trying to think of how people are going to frame this game. You know, the headlines people are going to write trying to describe it, which I'm sure is very frustrating to the talented dev team. But if people are just like, okay, so it's kind of a Left for Dead meets Stranger Things, what do you think about that comparison? That is, I would say, 100 percent accurate. Certainly. Oh an internal touchstone. You know, as, as far as the gameplay experience, I'd say it's sort of a first-person cooperative horror game centered around this group of teenage friends uh, investigating a monstrous secret beneath the skin of their town. And from there, hopefully, a lot of the, the sort of implied tools and, and techniques uh, will, will become obvious. Yeah, I mean, from coming from you know, a love of D&D, &D, did you consider having kind of the DM in this game, kind of the more asymmetrical format for the scares? Oh my God, yes, constantly. <laughs> like I, I, I basically, I, I'm always thinking, where can we, where can we integrate a hidden room where you see the sort of battle mat and you see the yeah. miniatures and so on without people saying, you guys are copying Stranger Things. Like, <laughs> no, those kids were not born <laughs> when I became into D&D, &D. <laughs> dang it. <laughs> but I'm sure we'll have to keep it sort of liminal. Yeah, so I mean, did you go down that road at all of having any sort of control for the other side? Do you feel like that has been done more in the industry in the last couple of years, so it's less interesting? Um, honestly, I I will never sort of lose my love for the dungeon crawl. Like Darkest Dungeon is a game that that in many ways changed my life. I put more wow. more hours into that one than I can think of, and and no other procedural game ever sort of connected with me on that level. Um, and that is horror meets the dungeon crawl. You know, I. In the Blackout Club, our specific sort of gesture towards that is the growth system, the sort of major and minor powers that you earn through play and uh, the combos and upgrades of which make your specific uh, teenage investigator um, much more potent and, and varied uh, from your friends after you spent a few hours in, in our uh, game experience. So I, I think it has, you know, RPG... Uh, tattoos on its back, uh, and and you have to sort of uh, you have to sp spend a little time with it before we reveal them, which is a very weird metaphor when dealing with teens. But there it is. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned Thief Three a little bit earlier. I mean, there are other games throughout your history of game development that you've been thinking about a lot 
while developing this game? Are there certain lessons where it's like, you know what, on this game we learned this lesson, let's apply it here. Is there what what era of your life you've been ruminating on the most recently? I guess. Hmm. Well, the practical reality um, is one of the major ones. Like this is unsexy, but just the 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 business mindedness uh, that brought us to okay, this game is going to involve players working together because players are almost always more interesting than a canned AI. Uh, and moreover that the adventure goes on for as long as you want it to. And, and as we update the game, new elements will leak in, but you don't see the single scripted cutscene, and then you've expended the content. That is the main thing that we, we learned on a sort of pragmatic level on a more personal creative level, I've wanted to do modern horror since 2005 or six, the universe uh, that this takes place in. Uh, I developed uh, way back then and it's just evolved over time. It has, you know, we talk about Lovecraft, it, it has a very deep and uh, I would say slightly crazy making mythos uh, at, at its heart. And we will only ever reveal parts of that to you. Uh, and so it's it's fun to finally be able to do horror in a modern setting because all of my other games have been either, you know, sort of quasi medieval steampunk or or period pieces like Bioshock. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm thinking now of Fracture But Whole also had a kind of Lovecraftian stuff, at least during one segment in a modern school or like neighborhood environment. I mean, so you were a consultant on that game or what was your actual title there? Yes, uh, creative consultant, I think, is what my title shipped as. Uh, I have a good relationship with those guys, and, and we continue to work together on, on uh, any of their, their RPG projects. Um, this is and, Ubisoft uh, specifically, you know, you're saying? Oh, I, sorry, I couldn't hear that. Ubisoft San Francisco specifically? Ubisoft San Francisco, but specifically South Park uh, oh, themselves. Um, you know, they, that was sort of brought in for the first game, and, and my relationship has really continued mainly with, with the South Park Digital Studio. Oh, wow. How did that come about? Well, um, after Bioshock Infinite shipped, I departed uh, the the 2K Games uh, sort of um, studio in Nevada and uh, amicably, you know, I said, hey, you, you shipped it. So thank you. Um, and <laughs> I said I was happened. going independent. Yeah. But there was some time to wait while my partner, Stephen Alexander, was moving out from Boston. And uh, he, he and I had worked together on Bioshock 1 and wanted to start the studio. But in the meantime... Uh, an old friend who had worked with Ubisoft previously put us in contact with Ubisoft SF and they said, okay, look, like we have this, we have so many cool elements. We would like somebody who can speak uh, writer and television person uh, and also speak game person uh, to sort of help bridge uh, the two development groups for that game. And um, they apparently liked what I had to say because uh, we have continued to work together since. That is a almost impossible spot to be in, I feel like. And they've been working together for years and years, and then for you to come in, I'd imagine that takes a lot of confidence to say, all right, Matt and Trey, here's what you need to know. I know that I'm not somebody that you've been working with for years. You're like, hey, you've been working with RPG experts, but here's why you should listen to this new voice in the fray. It, it would have been, except that they're big gamers. You know, I, I, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I, I've always felt that um, that was easier than everyone imagined it would be simply because they were versed in the language of games and they cared about uh, the thing being a, a functional and interesting game experience first. And they knew they could deliver on their end of it. Yeah. I mean, but is it an overall lesson of just because you're a gamer doesn't mean you're a great game designer? I think so. I mean, they, they, they would probably be the first to say that they learned a lot <laughs> across both games. And uh, I've, I've always been impressed with the degree to which they are willing to own, uh, you know, what they, what they have, their original kind of ignorance about this or that concept and um, what they can do with it now uh, to, to improve each game they work on. Uh, it's, you know, they're, they're sharp guys. <laughs> they adjust well. They're geniuses for a reason, some would say, yeah. There is that, yes. Do you have any sense of the you know South Park Studios' reception towards Fractured But Whole's release? I don't. I mean, not in the sense of... Um, I, they, they all seemed very proud. Um, uh, and the last time that we sort of spoke about uh, Fractured was right before Ship. 
And so uh, we're, we're, you know, in casual contact and stuff like that. But they, they, I think they're the biggest thing they were proud of is how much more coherent it was. Um, I think as they've talked about before, the original game was was really, really big, yeah. like Skyrim big. And uh, there were a bunch of editorial choices made to, to bring it in, in smaller. Whereas this superhero story was fairly crystallized early on. Uh, they, they knew what the beginning, middle and end looked like. But that just means that they're going to get especially sick of that story by the end of it. But <laughs> that that could be true, although <laughs> it wasn't drawn out over the same amount of time either. You know, the, the I think there was a certain I think they they had learned um, here are the places where we have blown cold on story elements in the past. And yeah. so they locked those down early and, and just said, like, OK, these are our pillars and we'll continue to uh, if we change details around them, the pillars must stand. That's interesting. So you get the vibe that they want to continue making RPGs going into the future. Oh, well, that's a good question. I'm definitely not going to answer that one. <laughs> I don't know for sure. Well, hey, you talk about how much, you know, Matt and Trey learned. What did you learn from working on those games, specifically from oh, them man. or maybe just the development teams overall? Was there an epiphany or two along the way for you? Just that the core absurdity at the heart of game systems interacting with a human um, will always be a source of unexpected humor. And so if you can lean into that as opposed to sort of like, placing a fig leaf over it and trying to ask the player to look away from it. Um, some of the, the most powerful sort of laughs come from acknowledgement that the player is always kind of smirking at your gaminess and and you can embrace that, uh, I think, to your merit. Do you have specific examples from those games that jump out? Sure. Uh, one of the jokes we collaborated on in, in uh, uh, The Stick of Truth was uh, a fellow who is uh, leaving audio logs in a spaceship-like sequence. And uh, by the end, the, he's like, the only thing that there is to eat is audio logs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I was involved with that one and very happy with the result. <laughs> But <laughs> what extent, in that specific case, because that is one of the highlights of Stick of Truth, is all the stupid audio logs. To what extent were you involved then? Is it a matter of writing them, coming up with the idea, or just being the audio log expert, weighing in on certain tropes? Uh, I was in the writing room, and they, they work with a lot of other writers who are in the room, but the truth is that... Like, I am not going to teach them how to suck eggs. <laughs> like, they they always deliver the final script in a game like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's crazy. So something that really pops out when looking at the games you've worked on in the history is uh, the, the Harry Potter game, Sorcerer's Stone. Oh, wow. Jeez. All right. Now the, now you're going back even further. I'm very comfortable. <laughs> yeah, we're going to keep going back till eventually you're just a child. It's really all going to work out till you're around like that 13, 16 year old age, of course. Uh, but so with the Harry Potter game, it's do you think it's your most successful sales wise game ever? I mean, I was looking at like PlayStation 1 sales charts a while ago because I'm a big old dork. I was like, what the hell? This is like the seventh most highest selling PlayStation 1 game of all time. It's just unthinkable. Yeah. Now... There is a there is a point of clarity, which is that I worked on the PC version, so I think oh, the answer is no. I think that Bioshock eventually outsold the PC version of Harry Potter, okay. which was built by a company called Amaze Entertainment, uh, where I had my first design gig. Um, it was still wildly successful and way more so than anything I would work on for years, uh, <laughs> uh, and it was – we did our best very rapidly – uh, but, uh, yeah, the main thing it did for me was teach me to use Unreal Ed and, uh, teach me how to respond to feedback, uh, uh, without, you know, letting my, my tiny ego shatter. Uh, and, um, it, it gave me, I met Ben Golas, a brilliant designer who is sort of an unsung hero of the game industry. Um, and, uh, basically I think he redeemed me from becoming a terrible adventure game designer. <laughs> like I, I probably, I probably would have gone into to just hand drawn art and a few dialogue trees uh, without that education. So, I mean, how did it humble you? What did you have to scale back? Was it a matter of you got on the project and you wanted to just blow it out? I don't know if you're a Harry Potter fan or what thinking that you could kind of bite off more than you could chew. I did research. I, I read those books because of that game, but I, I did enjoy them uh, uh, once I, I sort of cracked the first one. You know, talk about teens versus the truth monster, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, true. There, there's, uh, if, I, if I'm honest, there's probably DNA going all the way back to there from the Blackout Club. But the, um, uh, I, I wanted systems that let you do whatever you want, or at least purported to do whatever you want, where you've got kind of a chemistry set and you combine them to make things go boom your way. Yeah. 
uh, Harry Potter did not have room for that kind of thing. It was a puzzle game where you did this and this and this and this and then we allowed you to the next room. I definitely walked out of that knowing I never wanted to work on that kind of thing again. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> hence hence my time on uh, at Iron Storm Austin with, with the Thief series and on, to, and on to Bioshock. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that chemistry set idea, and then it wasn't until Breath of the Wild, I feel like, where it was fully tackled in a giant way maybe yeah and now it's coming from the other side of the globe that's that's the the sort of glory of breath of the wild is it, it feels like you know westerners cannot claim the immersive sim anymore it's they're they're all over the place uh and uh, arguably it's becoming a meaningless term yeah did you play a lot of breath of the wild i watched my wife play a lot of breath of the wild i have uh, taken a vow not to play uh, anything single player um because not only does it focus me back on multiplayer games but my friends are very busy and it helps me manage my time uh so i'm i'm playing the hell out of divinity original sin with uh, ken strickland who i work with on fractured but whole oh yeah and uh i play darkest dungeon with my son <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I always have to have a ride along, and, and uh, so far I'm sticking to it. Awesome. Well, hey, Blackout Club, how close? Do you have a rough idea of how close you guys are to getting out there in some way, shape, or form? Well, officially, it's Q1 of 2019. Okay. That's our, that is our official release date. Uh, like you said, this game is ripe for early access, so there may be some other announcement along the way, but uh, that's, that's what we can commit to. Um, as far as playability... Well, we've got a very good friend with whom we'd like to do a uh, first playable sort of um, announcement where you can see real gameplay uh, for, for, for the first time. And uh, exactly when that's happening, we can't reveal just yet, but I'm hoping not too long. This game was playable early, as a lot of good multiplayer games have to be. Yeah, absolutely. So if people are interested in following the game, where should they go? Is there a Twitter account? Yes. Uh, so there is the at the Blackout Club is our Twitter account. And they can also go to... Uh, uh, www.blackoutclubgame.com and uh, you can find us uh, there and uh, you can also follow me at, at nullspeak on Twitter if you want. Uh, I will sometimes say things that we wouldn't with the official account um, <laughs> and that's what I got. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Jordan Thomas, thank you so much for your time, man. really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Absolutely. And thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of the Game Former Show podcast. Be sure to tune in next Thursday. We'll have a new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody. Post credit secret lore chat. Post credit secret lore chat. Dan Tech. I'm not a, I'm not part of this chat. Secret, secret lore chat. I have to actually get the credits to chat about it. <laughs> okay, Dan, we're gonna spoil the hell out of Go ahead, Metal okay. Gear Survive. Okay. okay, number one, there's a trailer that had Metal Gear Ray in it. Yeah. Is Ray in the game? Uh, there. I think they are. Uh, so at some point. <laughs> what? Well, because I'm not. I think it. It looked like Rex to me. When oh, I saw really? it, because at some point you have a mission to rescue Metal Gear, a uh, Metal Gear from Waves of Zombies. Uh, How do they explain that alone? It's not Sahelanthropus. It, it actually, you're you're wrong. It is literally Sahelanthropus. Oh, uh, that you rescue in the Africa jungle map that you don't really get to explore at all. But uh, oh, wait a minute. So it has the Africa map from Phantom Pain in it as yeah, well. It has a very very reduced <laughs> version of the Africa map, and in it's there. just a Sahelanthropus sitting in a room saying, "Come save." Yeah, basically, and you have to set up defenses and, you know, whatever. Kyle, this is uh, post-credit secret law chat mm. Mm. about Metal Gear Survive, yeah. so it's being recorded. Um, so don't say what you normally say around the office. Okay, so th the timeline doesn't get all messed up? Cause I, is it I mean, they don't really, like, so the biggest time travel, like, the biggest thing is that it is a time travel story. So, like, you learn at the end that it's it's not like a hellscape version, it's the future. Uh, DT is the future? Right, so it's like oh. the, the, the whole... So well, I don't know if you see. Have is you it seen like the, the alternate future, if like things go bad? Yeah, basically. Okay. So uh, have you seen the Lord of Dust? No. Okay. So at some point you see this thing called the Lord of Dust, which That's a is cool this, name. It was just this enormous creature that like they just the first time you see it, it just it's basically stomping around the entire thing. It's like stories tall. Hang and, on, am I gonna have to play Metal Gear Survive because this sounds pretty good? No, don't do it. Okay. Uh, so so it's this gigantic creature. That is stomping around. They tell you like, don't, don't ever touch. Like, don't look at it. Don't like, touch don't, it. Yeah. Don't, don't look at <laughs> it. Don't engage in it with it in any way. And it's kind of stomping around some of the later areas. So Does you it kinda... look like the thing in the Death Stranding trailer? Not really. Okay. Uh, 
so at some point you're like, okay, we have to figure out how to kill this thing, and it turns out that that's the thing that's been destroying, that destroys you know the world, and it leads to Dite being the the location. And so at some point you realize that one of the warp holes you open is a time travel one. And so you send off somebody. There's a whole storyline where one of the characters you meet on, like, Good Luck, is, like, you find the child version of Good Luck. Uh, the child version of Good Luck's in the future? Well, no, you find them in detail. And they're like, I don't know how I got here. And then so you send them off into the past. And then you realize, like, it's super it's super convenient storytelling where at the end, like, you receive regular messages from Good Luck. And his last one just at the end of the game ends up being, oh, by the way, I am this kid from the from the future that you rescued and now i'm back and so i went back in time to try to help you guys in the present and so this entire plot line of here's this giant monster that's going to destroy the world the entire boss is like you you defend three waves uh, against three waves of zombies and at the end you fire the rail gun that sahalanthropus had at at the lord of dust and that's the whole fight that sounds kind of cool is lord of <laughs> dust like a fantasy it's a creature or is it like a robot from the future no it's a it's a giant like it, it, it's sort of, it's a giant monster basically that's that doesn't so have a face. It's, it's fantastic then. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic beast, and that here's, here's where you find them. Yeah. Pseudo historical okay. fantasy. It's yeah, very clear. I want you to write all this up so I can read it, so I don't have to play the game. What, are it's there any other cool like Metal Gear lore tidbits that we should know about? I I didn't see that many. I I know I think there was one illusion that I I can't remember. But it, in terms of like here's how this ties into the rest of the Metal Gear universe, there's really none of that. Because it it does begin and end with, hey, XOF attacked Mother Base. You got pulled into a wormhole. And so, like, the, the big thing they tease out is that at the end, you send uh, Good Luck uh, back into the past, but you don't get to get out on your own. But you do save the world by destroying the Lord of Dust. So the thing okay. that they're teasing in the end game is, like, hey, maybe, you'll, maybe if you keep exploring, you'll find a way out. And so, Reeve... Does he have a big character moment, or is he just a whiny? No, little it's goofball? like all the characters like kind of suck. Like they're, yeah. they're not, they're not good. And then the other thing is that like as you explore the map in the post game, they at some point you'll say like, oh, here's a, there's a large creature detected that you need to go fight. And so there are these monster hunter style bosses where oh. you fight this giant thing called Big Mouth, and he, <laughs> and it's like this. There's like 10 minute, 15 minute long boss fight where you have to whittle away its health. And like, that's interesting. Like, that's a cool thing, but it's, that it's was like, like a big creature. Yeah. It's like this big sort of monster hunter looking creature. That. And that you, you fight, fight. It again. It's this big mouth strikes again. Right. And the other one, I think the other one is like frostbite or something, which is the seven year either. Yeah. Okay. Comedy. Uh, is, that so a, like, is that a big boss reference? Big mouth. Is that what that's supposed to be? It doesn't look anything like big boss. <laughs> if that's what you're asking. Okay. <laughs> it's not like a giant big boss. <laughs> Kept oh, you waiting, man. huh? Yeah. Uh, so it's like that's one interesting mission, and then the rest of it is just like go find a survivor, go find a chest, go find a survivor. Like that is the loop that you are running, which is yeah. you know kind of shitty. But like in terms of the lore, there there are these very interesting tidbits that just lead to like just farts. It's not, it's just terrible. All right, well thanks for staying post credits on the Game Informer yeah. show. Uh, be sure to come to Fulton Brewery on March third if you listen <laughs> to this in time and uh, tell us what you think of Big Mouth. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs> Bye. Wait, that's the net. There's a Netflix show called Big Mouth, right? Not that one. Okay, oh, bye. <laughs>